Daniel, it's great to see you again, dude. Hey, it's really good to see you. You look really great, good, man. You look really healthy. It's nice to see you. You know, it's funny. I don't feel healthy today because I'm, I'm on a really weird sleep schedule right now. And I was up till one in the morning. And just when I do that, it does not make me feel well <laughs> but i don't know i'm, I'm having how about I, this you look you look happy man i can just i'm tell very you happy I'm, yes i'm happy today i don't feel that healthy but um i want to jump back in time a little bit and just give you props I, i'm someone that considers myself loyal and i'm forever grateful to you for helping me launch my podcast and encouraging me to go ahead and move into the health and wellness space and being my my second episode ever on this show so I just want to start out with a bow to you and thank you for your faith in me and your support <laughs> uh, as a friend and a colleague. And I'm so excited Easy. to have you back on and, you know, kind of be one of the first people talking to you as you've come out of this woodshedding couple of years where you've been rebuilding a brand and a company. And, you know, now we're yeah. in the middle of this amazing launch that I'm so excited to be a part of. So I'm stoked to be back with you, dude. Thank you, man. And and I just want to say, like, when I uh, when you started your podcast, you were looking to me like a really good like I, I'm big into starting fires, you know, so you, you looked like a really well put together Tinder bundle. And when you have that, it's just like touch the coal to it. And, you know, the whole fire is going to go, you know, and I could just see like you had everything in place, like everything was happening. And I mean, to be fair, too, I suggested that stuff to you. We were we were speaking, we were sharing a stage, you know, it was like I could just see where you were going. I saw the audience responding to you. It was like really clear that this was the direction for you. And so it's been pretty awesome to watch you kind of come up in that. And, you know, like I was saying to you the other day, like a lot of the big name podcasters we were always talking about, it's like, I see you right there along with all their shows now. It's, it's just awesome. So congratulations and on your success. And thanks now for helping me as I kind of get a, a new podcast and, and show off the ground too. Oh man, I'm stoked, dude. I love what you're up to. So for those of you, uh, <laughs> or for those listening that are, already aware of you and even people that are new to the scene let's maybe start out the people that are aware of you and are like where's daniel been because everyone i know was obsessed with the rewild yourself podcast that's one of the few podcasts ever that i think i've listened to every single episode you know even if it like sometimes it would be about like a foodie one or something and i'm you know i don't really cook so it wasn't something i was totally into but the conversations were still so compelling that i would listen so i'm like a super fan of your show and then when you stopped that and went into this new project, I and my friends were kind of like, oh, dude, bummer. <laughs> like, where'd Daniel go? <laughs> so um, for those of, those of us that know who you are and we're kind of right. waiting for this, what have you been up to over the past couple of years um, besides getting yeah, married? It's, which is it's been like amazing. two years, I think. I think it's been two years. Um, you know, I always have one of the problems that I've had is that I didn't start off with like the ambition, like I'm going to be. I'm going to be a public persona or I'm going to be a public teacher. Or I'm going to start a podcast. You know, I watched you strategically begin your podcast. You put everything in place and then you turn the machine on. I was like in a car, a car is like rolling down the street and I jumped into the driver's seat and I'm trying to figure out the controls cause it's already going. So I was just writing online a magazine cause I had been speaking on stages as you know, back in the longevity days. Um, you know, when I was involved, uh, with, people like David Wolf would have me on stage. And, you know, as you probably remember, I was getting up on stage and giving a message quite antithetical to what they were teaching. And they kept giving me the stage and I kept breaking down all of the stuff they were teaching about raw foods and veganism and being like, well, no, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I should, probably shouldn't do that. I was bringing animal food supplements into that scene. Eventually, it was kind of like, hey, man, like you're kind of ruining our thing. So, I started writing. Uh, I wanted to do an online magazine because I like to write. And I would. I started doing interviews along with that because I wanted it to be multimedia. And, uh, you know, the number of readers I had, you know, six, seven thousand people reading the articles, these long articles I was writing and everything. But all these people, you know, a hundred thousand people listening to the to the podcast. And it was like, OK, this is what people want. But I was already 20 episodes in by the time I figured that out. And I'd never stopped and strategically set that podcast up. So I always felt like I was running behind it, trying to catch up to the momentum that it had. And then through the course of that podcast, because if you recall, I was exploring a lot of taboos around wildness. I was looking at food, but I was looking at things like sex and birth and death and drugs and all these taboo areas of human psychology. 
But the piece that's always been most interesting to me is the food piece. And I felt like, uh, well, what was happening is as I was doing that podcast, I was getting drawn deeper into the world of foraging, hunting, and fishing. And I was like, oh, I have a real passion here. This is where, for me, all of the lofty intellectualizing meets the road. Like, can I even feed myself? Before I get so far out that I'm like thinking about all of these concepts that are like really difficult to bring into reality, could I even like feed myself off my landscape? And that was what became really interesting to me. And the podcast, as I started to take it in that direction, it was like, okay, that's not what everybody was on board for. I was like, I need to step back. I need to just stop for a second, reassess my career, figure out kind of what I want to come out with and relaunch. So for the last two years, I have not been uh, on vacation. <laughs> as you now know, I've been making a TV show and, and recording podcasts. I created a whole new brand called Wild Fed. The idea is kind of like you'd say like a cow is grass fed. This is like, what's a wild fed human? And uh, another thing you're familiar with, you remember um, through our mutual friend, David, I was, uh, who has a production company out there in LA, I was pitching some shows around LA. You remember that? Oh yeah, for um, sure. In particular, I had done that one sizzle reel called Rewild. And, you know, I had a great opportunity to speak to executives from basically every major network. And uh, every time I did that, I would walk away like shaking my head because they would say things like, we make terrible TV. And we know it. And your show is too good. Uh, <laughs> or they would say, they would say, this is really cool. We like it. We need to dumb it down. You know? And in the end, I had Nat Geo after the show. I had, I had Discovery after the show. I had Animal Planet after the show. And I just, when I saw what they were going to pay me, when I saw like what, how they were going to treat me, when I saw how little control I was going to have, not with David, of course, they were amazing, but with the networks, I just got, I, was, I just walked away from it. And then eventually, as you know, too, I got married and I, you know, that whole process of walking away from this idea of open relationships and polyamory, all this stuff that I thought was like so cool and wild. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude. Chaos. <laughs> chaos creates chaos in your life, yeah. you know, for me. Yeah. And I just had to do a big reassessment, you know, so I just rebuilt myself, got re kind of reconstructed. And I also was like, man, I really like this idea of making a show. I want to just do it myself. I connected with a great producer out here and we were like, let's just make it. Uh, let's why do, do we don't need to bow to any of these corporate, you know, we're not going to have the distribution. We're not going to get the immediate off, you know, the, the budget out the gate, but let's try to make it ourselves. And so we've been shooting a TV show. I've now shot almost two full seasons of it and I've been stacking up podcasts along the way. I just launched the podcast Wild Fed last week. So uh, I think yesterday we it was our second weekend and uh, we're getting ready to start showing people the TV show. And you are one of the first, I mean, you're like one of 10 people who've seen the number of episodes you've seen. Very few people have seen it. Oh, dude. And it's, I, I love this because I've, as you know, I've lived in Hollywood for a long time and I've, you know, used to work in the industry and there's so many great creative people here and there's so many wonderful things about Hollywood, but uh, it is a company town and it's a business, you know? And so you have all these creative people like yourself and so many others that I've met and worked with over the years that are doing great things and even impactful projects, not just entertaining projects, but projects that are going to help move uh, mankind and our consciousness forward. And when you try to mix those with the multinational corporation media companies it gets tricky and you know i'm really pleased that you went cool thanks and no thanks i'm going to do this myself and what i have to say is one of those 10 people who's seen your show <clears throat> and you know i have i have no vested interest in kissing your ass obviously or propping you <laughs> up or getting people to buy your show or whatever it's just like dude it it looks and feels as good as any show on netflix nat geo Discovery. I mean, it's it's a real show. This isn't like a homemade it's iPhone. Not YouTube videos. Yeah, not it's YouTube not videos. YouTube videos. Because no, one of the dude. things is, as I tell people about it, I'm like, you know, I I've been really lucky. Uh, the Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife, which is sort of like the equivalent of uh, you know our fish and game agency out here, has been working alongside me. Really, they've been amazing and connecting me with a lot of people for me to you know biologists and you know. Uh, legislators and and wardens and stuff like that and uh, on the project but they haven't really seen it and as I tell people about it or just I meet people or have people on for the podcast everybody I tell them about it and they all think I'm making YouTube videos right, and I try to tell right, them like no right. show it's got like an intro it's 30 minutes long it's got yeah. an outro 
you know, storylines are interwoven, but it's like people don't really get it or believe it, you know, especially because my team is three people, including me, <laughs> and we've made it, you know, I've got Jesse, who you've known for a while out in Colorado. I've got Grant Giuliano, my producer. We work really close together, become really good friends. And uh, and we've done this on our own, man. And uh, with, you know how it is, with the tools that we have access to in this really interesting window in history. I mean, who knows how it will be in the future? Uh, we know what it was like in the past. Suddenly, you could do that on your own, you know. And I'm, as an entrepreneur, I'm in a place where I have the time and I have the the funds to do it. So I've been able to to take two years of my life and make this show. And I hope I can make many more seasons of it because I got a lot of ideas for episodes. You know, there's so much there uh, to to make. So, and just for people listening, here's kind of the arc of the show. And a typical episode looks like this: I go out in the field and I hunt something, and that could be a fishing trip. It could be collecting clams. It doesn't have to be like a hunt, like, you know, after a big mammal or something. A lot of the episodes I do are are after little small things most people don't think about. But we hunt something. We can bring a protein back from the landscape. We go out and we forage something. So it could be a plant or multiple plants. It could be uh, something that's not a plant, like a mushroom, a a fungus. Or it could be, again, not a plant or a fungus, but like an algae from the protist kingdom, like a seaweed. But we get some kind of not animal and we bring that back. And then typically we bring that to a chef or a cook. Occasionally I'll home cook at my home, my house, but we bring that food back and we create a meal. And then anybody who is with me to the, to hunt or to forage joins us. And we have this like shared meal experience. So typically the episode kind of closes out at the end of the meal and that's an episode, but then there's a seasonal arc because, you know, I start first thing at the beginning of the year in the snow, making maple syrup off my trees here. And I end the season on the ice, ice fishing. So as the episodes go on through the season, you see sort of it go from spring to summer to fall to winter. Uh, so there's like these two simultaneous arcs. Um, and I just think, you know, I, I like the tone of the show. I like the, I like the, there's like a reverent, but still exciting and adventurous tone to it. And, uh, it's something I don't think they would have let me do, you know, if I ended up at discovery or Nat geo, they just, they don't make that kind of show. Yeah. And you, you would have had to like, show a a bottle of coca-cola in the background or something (laughs) exactly exactly my joke is always you would have to bring either a celebrity on so it would have to be like you know britney spears is coming with us on this trip or it would that was like that that they always wanted to either do that or they would want to take like overweight um you know midwestern housewives out on the trip to like show the contrast so that was the two things the networks would always say celebrity or like overweight people from a typical standard American lifestyle. And I was like, that's not the show I want to make. I just don't want to make that show. So yeah. now we're making it how we really want to make it, you know? Well, there's a couple of things that are very cool about that. And and going back to where you first were going with our ability now to have sovereignty. And, you know, that's, I think, tenuous because of censorship and things that are going on now. But I have a feeling now that it's like, you can't put the genie back in the bottle now that people like you and I have figured out how to be our own independent media companies. And Mm -hmm. I love that what you've done is circumvented YouTube also, you know, um, in that it's not a YouTube show so that if you say something they don't like, or they decide that, Right. hunting is now right wing or whatever the fuck that y- which will happen yeah, which is yeah. going to happen yeah but you have you control know? of you have control of your own yeah. content and even even in the context of having a podcast i mean there's certain topics i tiptoe around a little bit now like vaccines and things where i'm like oh i don't even know if i could if i'm allowed to ask a question about something now which is terrifying but i have a feeling that now that we all have great audio and video equipment Uh, And, you know, even if we were completely censored, eventually we would find a way to put our content out through the dark web or some encryption. Like now there's no like shutting us up permanently because we're going to find a way. And um, not that you're doing anything controversial, but we're not um, we're at an exciting time where we're not beholden to corporate interests. Right. In, in the production of our content and, and getting out and sharing transformative ideas. I mean, when I watch your show, I'm like, wow, Whole Foods really sounds shitty right now. Like, I want to go eat those <laughs> wild leeks and like the halibut yeah. right off the boat and the wild yeah. turkey. These are the episodes I watched last night. I was binging it. <laughs> so that's why I was up to one in the morning, by the way. It's your fault. Um, <laughs> and I really had to make myself stop. I was like, oh, I want it because I think I watched... 
I think it was like one and five. And I'm like, ah, oh, but I like, as you said, the seasonal arc, I kind of screwed that up because we were in spring right. and then, you know, winter or whatever it was. It looked warm and then colder uh, to something like that. Um, By the way, I'll be controlling that a little bit because on what you're saying, like having sovereign control of the media means I can put it out how I want. And I'm putting it out one episode at a time because I don't want you to stay up till one in the morning. And I want people to see the episodes in sequence. I understand how some musicians feel when only one of their song is being downloaded. And they're like, that song fits into a greater um, artistic ensemble and taking it out of context something's lost and i i'm a, a little concerned about that so it is nice to be uh you know sort of in control of it but anyway sort of back to what you're saying yeah so. well the the other thing that so that's part a is like screw the man we're gonna make our own <laughs> content and we'll find an audience and it might be a thousand raving fans rather than a hundred thousand uh lukewarm fans right yeah. But there are people that are really deeply invested in the content. And the second part that I'm really excited for you about, and I think what makes the content compelling, is that you're actually just living your real life and Mm -hmm. documenting it in an Mm -hmm. aspirational and educational way. And um, I'm managing to do the same thing. In other words, like... I would be doing the exact same shit I do every day if it wasn't my job. I would be tracking down interesting people that I can learn from and having conversations and trying different modalities in the realms of spirituality, health, biohacking, going on adventures, going to Costa Rica, doing ayahuasca, doing whatever. It's the same shit that I'm doing. I just like live stream everything, have microphones and cameras mm-hmm. going, and I know. And you. the doorway to opportunities mm-hmm. opens a bit wider once you start creating the media. So what's cool is it's sort of like, as you know, when you podcast like you're doing, it's it's kind of like you get this beyond college education in your um, disciplines of choice. You start to get to bring the professors to you. You get to sit down with them one-on-one and ask all your questions. Like if you're, you pay $150,000 a semester, sit down in a room and barely get your questions in. You know what I mean? You get to have it how you want it. So for me, this is partially to get kind of, you know, what I'm after, what I would like to do would be harder if I didn't have this. Um, also, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for about 12 years, you know, and that's, I started Sir Thrival 12 years ago. Um, it's pretty amazing to me where like we've, we've made it 12 years, you know, and, I've had a kind of a guiding philosophy, which is like, keep it small, keep it all. Because I see a lot of people build up businesses that get bigger than they, there are certain people I know who want to have a huge business and be at the head of a big organization and who have those big visions. And I really respect that. I'm just not that guy. Like, I don't want to be the CEO of a big company with a, you know, I don't want 300 employees. Like I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't <laughs> sleep at night, but yeah. You know what I mean? I want to keep a slick, lean team. I want to be team leader of like an elite special operations squad, not a general of an army. You know what I mean? And full respect to people who have the endurance to do that other thing. But uh, I have learned like, and this is what turned me off too, when I saw what to do a television show the way it's typically done, I was going to need to be in the field with six, seven people. I was going to be traveling with a big crew. We were going to have to have new photographers, videographers everywhere. Every town we went to, they hire PAs in those places. And it's just like all this craziness that I was like, no, I want like my buddy and me to be in the field together, you know, maybe one other person. And I want to just keep it slick. Um, The other thing that's really important to me is that when I make media, I got three things in mind. I want it to be very entertaining. I want it to be very educational and I want it to be very artistic. And I think that you get um, entertainment on most television today. With the advent of Netflix making their own content and Amazon making their own content, art's starting to come back. Because, man, I mean, did we ever lose art in American television? But it's starting to come back. Education is pretty slim. And I think that people are smarter than uh, networks give them credit for. And I think people do enjoy learning, especially if it's through an artistic and entertaining medium. Um, But like you said, I would rather have a thousand people who are fully on board than 10,000 people that are partially on board. And so one thing I like about controlling my own show is that I I can develop relationships with that, those people who are following it and be a sort of a guide for them. And, uh, and yeah, I don't care how big it gets. I care how successful it is. And when it comes to, to a successful business, It's the bottom line. It doesn't matter if you have, I mean, you could have a million customers at a dollar, right? Or one customer at $1 million. Both are equally successful projects, right? 
for me, like I said before, if I can get one client at a million dollars, I'm a little, I'm sleeping a little better at night than if I'm managing a million clients at a dollar. That's just a stressful business model to me. So, um, anyway, that's kind of a little bit of the vision for how I want to run it behind the scenes. And I, last thing is I just want to say, um, anything I make has always been a Trojan horse for something deeper. This is about wild food on the surface, but as you know, and knowing me, it's like, uh, it's about a lot more than that. I really want to awaken people to something that I think has gone dormant in them. And I'm using this show and, and food as a Trojan horse, as a vehicle to get to that destination. Yeah, I totally understand that perspective. <laughs> I do the same thing as you might have seen. Like I sent you the the questions for the interview today. I never do that. Even when people ask, I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. I, I figured out the day, you know. <clears throat> but for some reason, I was excited last night. I think at one in the morning, finishing your couple episodes, and um, so I texted you the questions. But it's like these are things that I think are so important to talk about and I want to share them. And so there is yeah. a much deeper motive than, than just having a fun conversation with the buddy that I could have off air. It's like, no, I, I value your perspective and I want to get some of your Thanks. ideas and discoveries out in the world. Cause they, they've transformed me. And even watching those couple episodes of the show, I'm sitting here in the, you know, now I'm in the Hollywood Hills at least. So I'm, you know, a bit more wild than your average Angelino, <laughs> but still I'm going like, I got to get the fuck out of here. I'm like envying <laughs> your life. I'm having like serious envy. I don't know that I want to wake up at three in the morning and go out in the snow fish, you know, like ice fishing or something. Maybe snow not. Fishing. Yeah, maybe not <laughs> snow fishing. See, shows you what a, a city mouse I am. Uh, I don't know that that's my path, but definitely just like, wow, what a great life one could have of having a more visceral connection to the planet man just to where yeah. we came from and um yeah. you know with all the biohacking and all the stuff i'm into it's like the more i learn and the more shit that i try the more i realize is like watch the sunset watch the sunrise get hot get cold eat food that's unadulterated drink spring water you know it's like the stuff that really moves the needle yeah. is just like getting outdoors i mean you could say like the ultimate biohack is just get out of your fucking house like that. Yeah, it can be pretty encumbering after a while if you try to recreate that without actually doing the real thing it, you, right. it takes a lot of equipment a lot of devices a lot of like before you know it you're like man this is a lot of stuff i'm managing yeah you know whereas it just sort of happens as a byproduct of a lot of the stuff we do in the show i mean this morning you know from 5 a.m to 10 a.m i was sitting in a tree out in the snow out in the cold you know, just like already out there, already breathing the fresh air, getting cold, right, you know, right. but, um, so you, yeah. Want, and as you, you saw with the show too, I, what's that? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to say too, that, um, you know, I don't, I think a lot of people come to my house and they're like, Oh, I thought you were like more rural than this. Like t compared to LA, we're pretty, you know, the Hollywood Hills, I'm, I guess I'm pretty rural, but you know, I got a supermarket right down the road. It'll like take me five minutes to get there. You know, I'm not that rural. And a lot of what we're doing in the show, like if we zoom out with the drone, you're like, oh, okay. He's like in a small town area. You know, we're not like, this is not a show where it's like in this episode, I'm in Northern Alaska dropped off by a small Cessna. You know, we're going to be picked up in 42 days. It's not like that. I mean, episode four, I'm like down in the Florida Keys on route one harvesting iguanas on the side of the road you know it's like yeah, yeah. some of it's fairly urban so um partially i want to motivate people to see that there's stuff they can get involved in pretty easily like pretty low barrier to entry as an adult onset hunter fisher forager i was like oh man there's a big barrier to entry and i think i can reduce that barrier a little bit and the main thing i'm pushing people for is like hey you don't got to do all this stuff like just like can you find one thing that you can do like if your one thing is like there's a raspberry bush down the street and you and the your wife and kids go like once a year and harvest like quart of raspberries and you have that little family tradition, like that's that relationship and connection to place. And there's something to you look at how much money gets spent on terroir, you know, like look at the wine industry, like the amount of money people spend on terroir. It's one of the only industries where that is really talked about and valued the taste of place. And man, this lifestyle, I'm telling you, you start to get the flavor of places. It's really interesting where you're eating, you're sampling the flavors of an ecosystem. You're, you're, you're tasting the places where you are. The cells of your body get made of the places you visit. You know, it's something really powerful metaphorically there that I get really excited about. I think there's something very powerful, even biologically and scientifically, 
after having many conversations with Jack Cruz that I've shared with you, who's one of the more controversial guys kind of on the health scene, <laughs> but his perspective as out there as it sounds sometimes really is about being in alignment with our environment. And yeah. I, I'm not going to do it justice, but he explained to me in one of our conversations how this idea of eating locally is not just like, oh, it's cute because we go to the farmer's market. He's like, it's really bad for you to eat foods that have been flown in from another time zone and another mm -hmm. season somewhere else. And if you're living in Quebec and you're getting bananas from Ecuador in December, they have um, has to do with light. And again, you know, I'm, I'm totally Flintstonian uh, perspective here, but um, <laughs> yeah. is it has to do with light and we are beings of light and the light in the food that you eat from other places and other seasons does not resonate with your body and your body literally rejects that food. Whereas when you're eating seasonally and locally, there's a bioenergetic match and resonance to the food, and this has a molecular impact on your biology, which I think is so fascinating. So now it's sort of like, I know after those conversations, I notice more when I go in the grocery store and I'm like, wait, these aren't growing right now. <laughs> Where are these from, <laughs> yeah. you know? Where um, are they growing right now? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. like, wait, mangoes? Even in, We don't even have mangoes in Los Angeles. All year, you know? baby. All year. Yeah. yeah, you know, Jack and I, I don't know Jack really well. Uh, when I've been, when I listen to him, I'm like, I always feel like, wow, this guy's willing to go out on some limbs that I'm not willing to like, go out on. You know, I want to yeah. stay on some thicker branches for sure. But, um, but we had a moment. I don't know what event it was at. We were both speaking at something. And I said something like, um, I think at some point we're going to understand that freshness, which is not just with food, like fresh food, yes, but fresh water, not in the sense of not salty, but like water that's fresh out of like the spring or fresh out of the well, um, fresh air. I think there's an electrical component to that that we'll one day understand better, or maybe it's photonic. And I don't think we have a good language around that just yet, but Jack is, that's part of what he's talking about. Anyway, I said that one time on stage, uh, just speculatively. I, I don't like to come out and be like, this is how it is, but I was sort of speculating. And Jack was like, yes, that, that's what I'm saying. And I was like, oh, we had this like little moment, you know, where we kind of agreed. And uh, I think similarly, so one of the guiding principles at Wild <laughs> as an organization is this idea of being made of place and um you know i love it it doesn't work as a tagline because people are like what does that mean but but when you start to explain it to be made of place like most people are made of a whole random assortment of places i don't mean this dogmatically i have lots of room for imported food i think that that's like i don't want to create i don't like creating rules i've done a lot of that in the past it's it's such a trap but um this idea that your body is made of water from one place. It's made of, you know, fruits from another place. The meats are coming from over here. It's all these different places. And you're, you're living in one place, but building your body out of all these other places when there's all this food and all this water right here in your food shed and watershed that you can be built out of. And however that works, like you use the language resonance. Um, I don't know what language will eventually land on when we finally have science around this and it's really been explored. Part of it has to do with nutrigenomics. So Part of it has to do with the interplay of food in your genes, which is a kind of a new emerging nutritional science um, that's still in its infancy. Part of it probably does have to do with what you're saying photonically with light levels. Who knows how it is that food and water as information communicate with your body, but I really think that there's something deeply nourishing and satisfying about being made of, at least in large part, of the place where you are. And uh, that's per it's gotten so rare today. Most people are made out of, they wouldn't know where they'd have to look at the sticker on their piece of fruit to know even where they're being made out of they wouldn't know where they'd have to look at the sticker on their piece of fruit to know even where they're being made out of yeah you know it's funny i remember when we spoke at neil strauss's event and i was just looking at uh, the video for that because i was updating my website it was in 2015 yeah. i'm like we're on the eve of 2020 I thought, holy crap it was five years ago i gave my first yeah. public talk in you know on the topics of health and I was so excited to be sharing the stage with you and David Wolf and Jack Cruz and uh, Ben Greenfield, all these all these big guys that I was a fan of and listening to. And not only did I get a great vote of confidence from you afterward, when I remember exactly what you said, I was like, how'd it go? You go, dude, you killed it. You could totally be doing this. You realize that, right? And I was like, what? 
I thought this was just like a fun thing to go do at my friend Neil's event. You know, I was just, he, I'll put something together. Anyway, point is, um, afterward, Jack comes up and kind of taps me on the shoulder. And, and, and Jack Cruz <laughs> right, famously right. disagrees with 99.9% of the people in the health industry. You know, I mean, right, he's right. like a huge provocateur. Contrary. Yeah, contrarian, yeah. And he comes up and taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, man, I just want you to know. Oh, no kidding. Uh, <laughs> oh, everyone cool. here is totally fucking full of shit, except wow. you and that guy, Daniel. Wow. You're the only two that know, <laughs> yeah, you're the only two that know what you're talking about at all, wow. scientifically. Wow. And I was like, God, I'm so unscientific. You know, I was shocked that he, uh, you know, had that perspective. But yeah, he definitely resonated, I think, with both of us because we're yeah. both coming from the perspective of let's kind of go back and look at where things came yeah. from and where we went astray and do our best while still living as somewhat normal people. Well, how do we get back in alignment with what's just natural? Um, speaking of going back, uh, now that we've like gotten super excited about the new stuff, which I'm pumped about, and we'll, we'll give a little more information on that later, but I find your journey so interesting because when I first <laughs> found you, you had like these long ponytails, you were doing these videos on, you know, Details. Yeah, pigtails. Sorry, not ponytails. I think you can only have one ponytail. But you had like long hair, you're tattooed all over, and you were, you know, coming out of the like the raw vegan movement and doing these elixir videos and all this stuff. And I found you to be very compelling and started following you. And then, as you said, you you sort of just went off the rails well, got, the next got on like, the rails. You know, we should I be think, eating lard and <laughs> bacon and you know, like in the still kind of. Got on the rails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at least, you know, out of that sort of dogmatic scene. So I, I'd love for you to share, you know, what what made you go, wow, I don't want to be a raw vegan anymore. I'm that scene is so interesting. It's like um, or whatever. one of the interesting things about the raw food vegan culture when you're really a part of it is you got kind of two camps. One camp is super, super strict. And a lot of people start there, too. They end up in the other camp. Eventually, it's very strict and quite orthorexic. I mean, these are people who who are not well psychologically very often or are start off well psychologically and then this food journey takes them into somewhere you know, fairly unhealthy fairly quickly and um, they they're, they feel really good in the beginning because they're on this cleansing diet but eventually what happens is they start to become malnourished and um, start to have cognitive issues I believe too and, and emotional issues that result from living with so many rules it's quite monastic the other side of it is deep into psychedelic drugs I mean at a level that's like quite surprising and it's quite strange to find that, you know, there's like a heavy amount of tobacco smoking. There's like a lot heavy, heavy partying, staying up all night, lots of stimulants, all these medicines. And, and eventually you're like, okay, this isn't real healthy either. These people are outwardly telling one story and they're living a different story. And I, I got, you know, having had the opportunity to be on stage with a lot of the big authors, the big speakers and all the big names, I started realizing these people are not doing what they were talking about. They get on stage and talk about one thing. And then you'd get behind stage with them and they'd be doing some, uh, there's also a, quite a sex scene too. I'm sure you kind of have seen some of what I'm talking about. It's like, it's not what people think it is when they're like, Oh, green juices. It's like, well, green juices and LSD and sex. And you know, it's like, it's just it was this crazy world. And I was starting to be like, man, this is kind of not really where I wanted to be. <laughs> then I started to notice that a lot of the people who were doing the diet were failing at it. Like it was starting to not work anymore. Um, many of the big names are lying to you that they're vegan at this point. I mean, not you personally, I just need to the audience here. Um, you know, a lot of them started off vegan and now they've built such a prison around themselves that they can't come clean with the fact that they don't live that way anymore. And they continue to pretend to be. And I was just like really sick of the hypocrisy. Also, um, something I think we've talked about before is I, I got my interest was always in what is a natural diet for people. It wasn't about I wanted all these rules as much as I just wanted to like I always felt that if I could figure out what the natural diet for people was, that would be really good for me. And I'd like to pursue that because, you know, if you can think of any animal. You know, when you just go to an encyclopedia, you get on like Wikipedia and you look up any animal, you're like great white shark and you pull that up and you just go like scroll down. There's going to be a section that says diet. And when you read that, it's going to tell you what great white sharks eat. Right? You do that with every animal, but you go to people, it's like mm, homo sapien diet. It's like, who knows? Right. We forgot what our, it's crazy to me. Right. We don't we didn't know. It took me a long time to sort that out. And I, I fell into all of this compelling bullshit about uh, human beings being natural vegans and 
and raw foodists. And I didn't understand that cooking in the control of fire predates Homo sapiens and goes back to um, species that are in our genus, Homo. They're humans, but they weren't Homo sapiens. They weren't our form. So um, you can kind of find out if you trace your way back a little bit, you can find out that they had fire and that fire was given to Homo sapiens from prior species. We learned it from prior species. Also that we'd been eating meat and hunting far before Homo sapiens even came on the scene 300,000 years ago. It's not like there was this idea, there's this idea in veganism that at some point you got two kinds of vegans one type of vegan thinks that this is probably the larger group that human beings are naturally vegan and that we fell off the wagon at some point and that we've been living in a like kind of a uh you know like a binge cycle ever since we've been on a bender eating meat and and we're going to only get it healthy when we realize that we get back on the wagon and we go vegan again the, the other side believes that we maybe we weren't in the past, but now with science and, and agriculture, we can become vegan. That's a different argument. I can address that in a minute. But for those people who think in the past we were naturally vegan, it's like, sorry, there's this whole field of anthropology and archaeology, paleoarchaeology. We just know that's not true. That's just absolutely false. And one of the things we can do right now is look at contemporary hunter-gatherers who are still living in the way that they had lived ancestrally. We can see that they're on we can look at ancient human feces that's been fossilized. We can look at archaeological sites dating back hundreds of thousands and even millions of years where we see that ourselves and prior form uh, forms of our, um, our genus were uh, using hunting implements and cutting implements to butcher animals. This is just who we are, and we were cooking the whole time. So I came across a book called uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston Price. I'm sure that's come up in your show over the years. Um, and what's the price was this turn of the century, 1800s to 1900s dentist who was really just trying to figure out why we all had cavities and our teeth were not fitting in our mouth properly. And he went around the world looking at uh, hunter gatherers and tr people living their traditional life ways in agriculture. And he found that they had complete dental arches until with their teeth all fitting and no real significant cavities until they started to go on to the so-called Western diet. Uh, and that was, that changed my perspective really quick because he's got photographs you know from this time period looking at people's teeth and I started to realize like oh okay I'm on the wrong I'm doing this wrong this vegan thing isn't true you know I'm doing it wrong and um, eventually I started doing this thing on stage you know because I would get up on these you know the three four five hundred sometimes a thousand fifteen hundred people in an audience and I would just do this simple game I'd go put your hand up if you know a vegan you probably see me do this Luke. put your hand up if you know a vegan everybody's hands go up and then you go only leave your hand up if you know somebody who's yeah, been a dude, vegan I for more than five years and you just see this like instant half the rooms the hands drop and then I go okay only leave your hand up if you know somebody who's been a vegan for 10 years and then you got like handful of people left in the room and then I'll go 15 years 20 years and as you start doing that eventually there's no hands in the air and I'll say okay so nobody knows a lifelong vegan and it's like nope and then I go, so nobody, definitely nobody knows a vegan who was raised a vegan their whole life and met another person raised a vegan their whole life and they had kids. And then those kids were raised vegan and those kids had kids. So we have no like population dynamics to look at. We have no proof. In fact, nobody even knows a lifelong, like a lifelong vegan. There are more I try to put this in perspective for people. There are more Bigfoot sightings than there are sightings of vegans who've been doing it their entire lifespan. There are, there are more, right, more Yeti sightings. There are more alien encounters. There are more, like, whatever, whatever, pick your thing. There are more people who see unicorns than see lifelong vegans. Like, they are a mythical creature. Now, that's okay, because that means that veganism is a current, currently an experiment, and that's okay. We want to run experiments, and people who want to take part in that experiment should. But what they probably should be wise about um, is going around telling the whole world that they should all immediately adopt this or they are killers. It's like, oh, whoa, that's an experiment, man. Do the experiment. Run it for a while, because you might find in five or ten years you're not doing it anymore, and you got to uh, – 
a domino effect of apologies you owe behind you. All the people that you got in their face and criticized them or threw red paint on them or talked about how cold they were or what killers or murderers they were. It's like, man, you're doing an experiment. You can't talk like that to people. It's just not fair. Not until you have proof. And there's no proof. There's never been a society of vegans that's ever existed. There's never been a civilization of vegans that's ever existed. And when I realized that, I was like, oh, maybe I'm doing it wrong. And so, you know, that kind of led to my journey and, and rewild yourself as a podcast was an exploration of me going, well, what else is like that? <laughs> like, okay, that's what happened with food. What is it with sex? What is it with birth? What is it with death? Like I started getting really interested in like, how come I never see people born or never see people die? You know, like, well, that's not normal. Like, is that biologically normal? Like, you know, a lot of people when they first, uh, like with hunting, it's a really interesting thing because most people never see anything die. You know, or only a couple times in their life and they're like well this can't be right because when i watch it it feels really emotional to me it's like yeah man because you never saw it you would have been desensitized to that by the time you were three years old in any society that existed prior to what 1800 like <laughs> that would just be everyday normal for you death every day would just be part of it and it really puts you know brings you to terms with mortality which is a thing that most people are running from i mean you must like i know recently had some ayahuasca experience it's like you kind of come face to face dmt brings you face to face with death real quick you're like oh i get it now i'm just afraid of dying that's what this whole thing's always been about that's what i've been doing all this time I've just been running 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 from the fact that i am uh, in a mortal coil oops you know and people aren't confronted with it because they live really um sheltered from that so anyway uh i started a journey toward it then i guess like how i ended up hunting you know how i ended up doing all these crazy things is the journey of following well, a lot of people just give up early man you know it's why businesses fail it's why you know books don't get written or whatever it is like people follow the thread long enough if you follow the food thread long enough i don't know for me before you know it you're out in the woods like harvesting an alligator <laughs> <laughs> when you def when you defected <laughs> from that somewhat culty <laughs> click that you were running with for all those years and and also i think it's interesting that y you're not a guy that like you know started juicing and eating a bunch of vegetables a decade, for six yeah. months Raw food, went, vegan oh, i don't know years. this isn't working you did that shit for what 10 years a decade <clears throat> yeah i mean that's i was a vegetarian for close to 10 years and um you know, I've told my story about that before on the show, and it, it, it didn't do well for me. It was not it was not a good um, uh, strategy for longevity. But I, I, I think that you gave it quite a fair shot, and it's interesting that you then submerged yourself and became a promoter. And then I respect the fact that you had the courage to go, oops, I, I made a mistake. I'm rethinking this and just own that and be willing to face so much rejection and opposition from your your fan base and your community and really be ostracized were you ever um, <laughs> did you ever experience getting death threats uh, uh, or anything well i want to say that, that uh, one thing i feel really blessed about is i never really had a public platform until i had already stopped being a vegan and already stopped um, being a raw foodist. In fact, I think the very first YouTube video that ever went up of me was me talking about honey, you know, and that was to a bunch of vegans trying to sell them on this idea of honey, you know. Uh, but yeah, for 10 years before that, I was very vocal, but I wasn't a public persona yet, you know. So thankfully, I never had to make that transition while, like I never had to like walk any of that back instead, but I was in that community and I was speaking in that community. Man, people have resonated to what I've been saying for a long time. Um, I get mostly really awesome feedback. I've had trolls for sure. A couple people who are like, um, sometimes I think about a remora. You know, that's that type of fish that hangs out attached to a shark. You know, you get the shark. Yeah, you can take one out of the water. Like sometimes when I'm fishing I've out of Florida, them, we'll catch I didn't one. Know what they were you can take that yeah. thing and stick yeah. it to the roof of the boat. It'll just suction cup right up there. You know, they got like a suction cup on the top of their head. That's like some of the people that I've dealt with, trolls. You know, they're like, oh, I like where that shark's headed. You know, it's attached to you and attack you and attack you in a way to try to get you know, <laughs> views, try to get attention or whatever. I just like right. ignore them, you know. Um, I play offense, not defense. I don't think I've had a lot of death threats, so I see that happening to people. It'll be interesting to see now with um, with Wild Fed because people are going to see me actually in the act of killing things. 
I think I present it in a pretty reverent and without getting new agey, not getting like too, you know, sought too out there with it. I think I present it with a good balance of reverence, but also like solidity in who I am and why I do it. But I'm sure that that is going to come. But I mean, I don't take any of that. Vegans are going to come kill me. Like kidding me. Like, okay, come on over. Let's, let's get down, bro. Like, how do you, let's see how you roll. Like, like what's your, what's your weapon of choice? I'm curious. Like celery, you know, a pie, a pie with cayenne pepper in like they did the rear Keith. Like it doesn't, you know, I don't take it very seriously. Uh, cause I think that they're just keyboard warriors, you know, um, I've never heard of like vegans actually doing anything like that for real, but, but it is fascinating how some of the most, you know, aggressively violent trolls are are the people who profess themselves to live in a nonviolent way. I mean, I think it's strange. I think, I, I think there's a strange hypocrisy that's very prevalent now, uh, socially, culturally, and obviously politically, you know, it's like, it's like politically now we're seeing so much, um, division, right. And there's this whole sect of society in America that, we hate the people that hate people. You know, it's like what used to be the tolerant sort of liberally minded sect that you would call the left are now like the most repressive. They're fully out of the closet now. They're fully out of the closet. I had no idea. You know, part of why I shut my podcast down too, I had a lot of reasons. You know, one piece was having talked about, um, because my podcast was about, you know, obviously I've got the new show now, Wildfed, but Rewild Yourself was about the idea of emulating how natural peoples had been living on the planet. Like how do we take some of those ideas into the modern world? And I was exploring a lot of the philosophy and around 2016 i i think personally this is just my view of it i think we'll we'll look back and and be like oh that's when the cold civil war started in the united states right just everything changed everything changed and a lot of the things that i was talking about oh absolutely started to sound too much like what i felt radical leftist people were talking about and i was like oh that's not how i mean that and I was like, I got to get out of the philosophical side of this and get into the real practical side of it because I didn't want to come off like I was in support of some of this stuff that I'm seeing now. I mean, I'm amazed as a liberal person. I'm amazed at what I'm seeing from that that side. Of, I hate to say the aisle, but but my opinion has always been planes have two wings, a right one and a left one. You use both wings to fly. You take one wing away, you crash. And this idea that you're going to destroy the left is going to destroy the right or the right's going to destroy the left. It's like, no, 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 no. It's like, it's like being like, oh, I'm going to remove my right brain. I'm going to remove my left brain. I only want one hemisphere. It's like, nah, I'd like to have both intact and functioning. They balance each other, you know, but uh, we're seeing, it's pretty crazy what we're watching now. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting wrapped up in that because when you start talking about things like sociology, which was one of the things I was really fascinated by, man, right now is not for me, not the time. I don't want to take on that fight. It's not what I care about, you know, but yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm yeah, I'm lucky enough to, um, you know, be able to give very light commentary about those things without getting too involved because I don't have you know, this isn't a show about social activism or politics or anything like that. But I, I have to indicate at times, I think, viewpoints um, to that end because of the censorship and things like that that are going on um, as a result. And that's when it gets kind of close to home to me. I, I really don't think whoever the president is makes much of a difference, um, or at least until recently. And on all of that, kind of just observing from the complete like <laughs> zoomed out perspective that I have. But um, but the thing that, that kind of oh, makes yeah. me nervous is when it yeah. starts to get into um, the First Amendment and also the Second Amendment. Oh, yeah. You know, these are these are two foundational pieces of Western culture and American culture and what actually created um, our society, and when those start, you know, going into dangerous no, waters, it. it's like I'll at least mention it. I get it. You know, I'm going to obviously by default, I'll be Second Amendment activist because I shoot there. guns in my show. But it's you know? like, dude. and I mean, 
the purpose that I'm using them for is not the purpose of the Second Amendment, right? Yeah. The Second Amendment wasn't about hunting. It's to protect the First Amendment, essentially. But, uh, you know, an interesting thing, Luke, that's come up for me, um, you were asking if I get death threats. And worse than the vegan trolls, actually, have be, been more like the Antifa-type trolls that I've dealt with. And what's happened is I'll, I, there's this contingent who would come at me and be like, well, why are you not using your platform to speak out against racism? And I'd be like, well, I hate racism. I like, I believe that all the different types of humans are all adaptations to the planet and each one is beautiful. Like we need all of these different races. We need all of these different types of people. I love them all. It's just my things about food. And they'd be like, I've had people call me a Nazi. I love them all. It's just my thing's about because I'm not speaking out against racism when I'm like, that's not what my work is about. <laughs> oh God, like, it would, where would I fit that into my thing? Like, it's not what my thing is about. It's like, that's a fight other people have taken on. That's not my fight. My fight's on food. That'd be like me going to a, a, an activist for, e you know, equal rights amongst the races and me being like, you're a Nazi. You're not speaking out about food. Be like, they'd be like, what? That's not my thing. So I've had like some of that come at me, but only, like I said, in these last couple of years, because I think a lot of people have like kind of lost their marbles a little bit and things have gotten really hectic. And um, it's unfortunate, man, because what I think is so, so cool about hunting and gathering is it's one of the things that ties every race together. It ties all types of people together. I mean, you could be any race, any gender, any orientation, your ancestors were hunter gatherers. This practice of gathering food off the landscape binds all people groups together. No matter where you go in the world, from the furthest Arctic, Inuit and Inupiat people who are hunting and gathering there, to the people in the equatorial jungles who are hunting and gathering there, to peoples of the desert, to peoples in all, all continents, all colors, all of it, right? It's like, this is just a universal human thing. So um, I kind of like that because this division that we're feeling right now i don't it feels like a lot of it feels fake to me it's like I, I part of it too i live in the northeast man i mean we were like the underground railroad right we were the we fought and died the people of the northeast we fought and died over this issue of slavery like to stop it you know so i don't know if i just because i live up here i don't see this everything's that what people are talking about but boy if i had i would think those people are a little bit more hardcore to me than the vegans because the vegans come off as like I just know that they're kind of soft, you know, they're not like they, when they act aggressive, you're like, dude, you're not, you, you don't have enough testosterone really to come at me. But, but some, some of the like hardcore activists these days are, like, I mean, I say it as someone who did so it for 10 years. So I have like special <laughs> exemption. I have a hall pass to say it, you know, <laughs> and you know no, what's going to happen know, too. People are going to put up a bunch of, what about this vegan bodybuilder? Yeah, well, I mean, I, and I you know you're going to get that stuff. It's like, yeah, you know, there's 10 of them, you know? What about this vegan bodybuilder? Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I am fundamentally a libertarian and I believe in sovereignty for human beings. I believe in sovereignty for nations. And I wish that we could just all have no walls and borders and everyone sing fucking kumbaya, but that's not the way that civilizations have been set up. We're not there yet. And so it's like within civilizations, within culture, you have individuals and those yeah. individual rights yeah. to me personally, this is my belief, are more important than the collective rights, right? Yeah. So I'm all for someone you can eat you know your lawn for the rest of your life and i support you and love you if that's what you choose to do i think why i get a kick out of these more provocative conversations that i can have with people like you is i don't like being told what to do or that i'm a bad person or that i'm wrong because of the way that i'm living my life and i don't i don't think that it's um i don't think that it's fair or ethical to shame uh threaten go after mm -hmm. people and try to hurt other people because of the way that they're living. And I, and I think I'm also yeah. just like, yeah. I have a very strong sense for hypocrisy and hypocrisy is dishonesty. Yeah. And I really resent dishonesty and disingenuous points of view that don't tell the whole story. For example, when you talk about um, racial equality, for example, and you put that in the context with living a life as a hunter-gatherer. 
I never hear anyone getting up in arms and fighting Native Americans that choose to go out and hunt and eat animals. In other words, I don't see get a special pass. going after indigenous peoples around the world for their life ways that include, that include taking the lives. But it's like the activists that are anti-hunter, mm -hmm. anti-gun, exclusively go after Caucasian males, especially if you happen right? to be in the Midwest, Northeast, yeah, Midwest, that's a really anywhere good point. off the coastal. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> you know, and so that's I, really I, I look at that and I'm just like, well, okay, so if I, if I had, you know, more melanin in my skin, would I get a pass on going and slaughtering a deer if I was proposing to do that in a reverent way? Um, in other words, there's this sort of supposition, and you could speak more to this, I'm sure, and I'd love to go there, that, and this is coming from someone who was raised by an avid hunter, as you know, my dad, I mean, he hunted since he's five years old, or maybe even four, I mean, when he could, like, shoot a gun, he was hunting, and so he has a, just a very, um, just a beautiful perspective on ecology and animals and how the whole thing works, so I was kind of brought up with that, even though I never subscribed to it, because I was a California kid that grew up with my mom, but it's like, Seeing my dad as a hunter and his friends, these aren't a bunch of slack-jawed, ignorant, racist, homophobic, xenophobic rednecks, man. These are like people that really care about the land, that are kind, non-racist people. And I think that oftentimes the sect and of stereotypes. citizens and that stereotype are and get by people who are saying not to stereotype people. Thoughtless people. Yeah, it's very, very much so. ironic. Who are saying not to stereotype <laughs> right so it's very ironic yeah so that's it's you know these types of things i'm just like ah it makes my head explode because I've, i'm seeing things from kind of two sides of it i think having the advantage of being raised in a very liberal culture in california by a very liberal mom and having a dad in colorado who you know is kind of living off the land and I would say politically came from a more slightly more conservative perspective, but was also intelligent enough to be inclusive and a kind, thoughtful person. Um, albeit while he's shooting the shit out of I get the question. The I get the question. And you know, I'm a so, major nerd. Anyway, I don't for, know if that's a question. Um, the work of Frank Herbert, just, who wrote the book Dune and the whole you know, series, the Dune series. Um, I mean, this is some stuff. You read it. It's novel, but it's man, it's on another level intellectually. Um, I mean, this is some stuff. Man, some heavy duty stuff. I go through them like once a year. Oh, I used to, I uh, in Dune it, he says uh, this kid, thing I just yeah. wanted to bring up real quick. He says, uh, yeah. scratch a uh, liberal and you'll find underneath the surface a closet aristocrat. Scratch a conservative and you'll find somebody afraid of change. And it's like, yeah, I, I agree with both of those statements. And you need both. You need both of these things. They're toggles. Um, and it's unfortunate the stereotyping that's going on right now. Um, I want, in my podcast on Rewild Yourself called Why I'm Not a Vegan, which has moved the needle for a lot of people, man. That one had some impact. I've got a lot of people. I, you know, it was years ago I recorded that, but I get feedback constantly from people who are like, that's – I just interviewed with a woman the other day who's been a vegan for eight years, and she's on a 30-day carnivore diet challenge. And uh, I was like, wow, that's pretty – that's one thing to the other thing. She, but she's like, I opened my mind to it because of your podcast. And I was like, Man, that's <laughs> wow. And in that podcast, I present several arguments um, for why I believe veganism is not as viable as people think. And one of the things I say in that show is like, um, would you be willing as a vegan to go with me around the country to visit Native American uh, or in Canada, they say First Nations reservations and to talk to the people there about how for the last 10,000 years, 14,000 years that they've been on this continent, that they were um, – murdering and uh, living wrong and that they should be vegetarians would you be willing to go tell them that because probably not right probably not you're probably not willing to go to indigenous people and tell them that they are doing it wrong you just want to tell people in your culture that and i'll get this interesting thing from time to time too like i'll get these messages from people that say like i shouldn't be foraging without the permission of native people which i always find really odd um given the kind of things that are going on on the planet it's like okay what about like dow chemical strip mining over there do they need to get permission i'm just picking fiddleheads like i need to go get permission to do that you know what i mean like it doesn't really make sense at this point 
point in history that I am the one like same with vegans when they come at you you know where it's like it's like man there are some fights that you could be fighting like if you believe because I do understand when you're vegan and you have this belief that um, this is murder like if I knew if I knew somebody was committing murders like in my neighborhood for instance I would feel a, I would be compelled to intervene on the behalf of the innocent right you knew you had a mass murder in your neighborhood it's like you got kind of got to do something about that i would feel moral obligation so that's what they believe and so of course their attacks against you which seem very bizarre in the moment are coming from where they are how they are seeing things but it's like okay so you're worried about the one animal i kill and not the like why are you not at mcdonald's right now dealing with that fight isn't that a more important fight than trolling me on the internet like how am i important enough in the grand scheme of animals dying why are you coming at me why are you not at the soy farm where you get your tofu from because their combines are running down thousands of rabbits a year and because they have paid hunters they are killing off the deer that are eating the soybeans why are you coming at me like doesn't it make more sense to look in the mirror a little bit because you're involved in it too and we're all involved in it so it seems a little strange and unfounded um man we're in a delicate time it's like i feel so terrible about some of the abuse that have happened to different people groups around the world and in particular here in North America but that's like so unrelated to me foraging me hunting it's like I just don't see those as connected so uh, it's been it's a confusing time man it's like I just don't see those as connected so it's a confusing time yeah and and on that note um, in in support of you and in defense in one of the episodes I was watching uh, last night where you guys were foraging those fiddleheads up on the river and you and Arthur Haynes, your botanist kind of mentor, amazing guy, um, who's, by the way, I'd encourage people to not only listen to your new podcast, but also go back and cherry pick the Rewild Yourself podcast. There's some great conversations with Arthur Haynes, who was on the show, but I found his perspective so uh, beautiful. He was talking about, you know, generationally how the native peoples for thousands of years have been stewards of that land and in fact the way that you guys were foraging and now you're educating future foragers to do is reseeding and not over picking and not killing off these blooms of leeks and any plants that you're out foraging i mean i think that the way that you're indicating to people that it, this can be done and obviously it's not accessible to everyone and we'll we'll talk about you know the the scalability and the limits of that but I thought that you and Arthur had a deep reverence for mm -hmm. not only the land, but for the people who were stewards of that land for time immemorial before you got there, and that you're actually carrying on the traditions in a much more respectable way than perhaps even the organic farm down the road that's just like, all right, I got a few acres, let's plow this shit down and grow some corn or kale or whatever, you know? It's like so much of it is in the, in the, in the details and in the intention and the level of consciousness with which someone is doing that and to give a blanket judgment that, hey, you're European, you're white, you came here, we we decimated these populations of native peoples and therefore now or viable or sustainable. Like, forever. don't you I not want me to do that? That's a thoughtful <laughs> approach. Yeah. Or viable or sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> don't you not want me to do that? So, so yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's just... I think both of us, you know, we're kind of born rebels. And so that's why I love having these conversations with you because we can think out of the box. I also, an interesting observation that I've made, I want to get your take on this, is that, and you guys listening, man, like you got to believe for me and I probably can speak for you. If whatever you're eating for your diet is like your yeah, do your experiments and it's making do your experiments. You good, like I'm all for that. It's none of my business. Do your experiments. My do your experiments. my role and what I enjoy doing and I just get a kick out of is really dissecting things and looking at it from every angle. And that's also coming from someone who as a kid used to cry when I had to kill a fish that I pulled out of the river, you know? So right. it's like I'm not where you are. Like I'm still very domesticated, very soft. Even like in your show, you, you shot two turkeys with one shot, which by the way, great shot. Uh, and then you have to walk up and break their necks and like put them out of their misery and they're still shaking. And even in the show, you're like, hey, I know this might seem a little harsh, but this is actually the most humane way to do it. And even watching that, I'm kind of like, oh, God damn, could I do that? I don't know. But I, you know, I'll go to Erwan and buy the turkey that probably lived a much shittier life on a farm 
and was perhaps killed even in a less humane way, etc. Um, but what I find interesting is, um, I always feel like I have to give those disclaimers because I know a lot of people that are choosing to live that lifestyle listen to the show, and it's like I'm not trying to attack them or make them feel bad. I'm just like wanting to open people's minds. And one of the things I've always found strange is that humans seem to have a hierarchy in terms of this, what you could po call perhaps speciesism, where we don't want to, we're, we're okay with killing a cow, but not a dog. And some of us are okay perhaps with killing a chicken, but not a cow. And some of us are okay with killing some acreage of land and killing, as you said, thousands of rabbits and rodents and reptiles and amphibians and birds and insects in order to grow some kale. And it's interesting the way that we've developed this value system and hierarchy of some creatures sentient or not, and one could argue that all living things are sentient to some degree, that we have a value system where this is okay and that's not okay. How do you think we get that? Man, there's a lot. That's a lot to unpack. Um, there's a lot there. Point of view. I want to use the word kingdomism too because you have these different kingdoms of life. Um, plants are a kingdom of life. Plantae and animalia is a kingdom of life, and there are a few others. So let's just take those two. The dominant belief amongst a lot of vegetarian people is that animal life has more value than plant life. Um, this is interesting to me because a lot of the times the people who will identify around vegetarianism and veganism tend to be against the idea of hierarchies. You know, there's this whole thing right now about hierarchy and about patriarchy and all these ideas. And I would agree, by the way, one of the interesting things, one of the things that really gives me like deep respect and reverence for the way that indigenous peoples have lived around the world, when we kind of look at, you know, I'm no anthropologist, but when I read the ethnographies or I read the reports of anthropologists, when you read these firsthand accounts, you see that those cultures did not have as much hierarchy built into them as ours do. Um, people were considered sovereign individuals. Now, that doesn't mean you um, didn't have rules you had taboo enforced by the tribe there's things that you do and don't do but they didn't have hierarchies it wasn't like um, the appeal to authority that we have in this culture this idea that like well he's the expert he's the policeman he's the you know whatever it is that gives them the reason that they are above you in this hierarchy right um, but for some reason those same people against social hierarchies have these biological hierarchies and they tend to favor charismatic animals animals. So you will get a lot more outrage about killing a bear than a blobfish. Blobfish just has no char charisma. That's a fish, by the way, if people want to look it up. Um, very unattractive fish by our typical aesthetic. Um, people are much more uh, reverent about lions and, uh, you know, zebras and giraffes than they are about mosquitoes. Right. Like most vegans I know kill mosquitoes and they don't feel bad about it. They drive cars and the grill of their car is full of dead insects. They don't seem to really be bothered by that. They're bothered by certain types of animals, which means they've organized life into a sort of a pyramid. And it seems to me to be organized around the idea that human beings are kind of at the top of that. So the next animal that you would have the most compassion for would probably be like chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas. And then under that would be sort of, you know, bears and things that kind of look more anthropomorphic. And then under that, you sort of get this thing and down at the bottom would be your mosquitoes and such. Right. And it's this idea that, yeah, like, well, some life forms are, have more value. It's interesting if you step back and you think, well, each one is alive. Does each one have an equal? Is it possible that life has equal value? Um, or is there really like a hierarchy of life? I mean, we seem to put people at the top of it because we have really different rules about treating people versus how we treat animals. Um, so, yeah, I think that people are specious, but I think they're also kingdomist and that they think plants aren't sentient. Yet, when the deeper we delve into plant biology and botany, it's like you start to realize like plants have quite a lot of awareness and um, pre exist you know, animals and algaes pre-exist. They're the algaes, the seaweeds, they invented sex. I mean, they're the first dimorphic. So it's like, to me, all life is sacred, all of it. And here's one of the things that I think people get confused about and they get a little caught up in. I think your typical like animal rights activist or, or even a person who's just like really compassionate about, let's just step away from this activism and vegan and all that for a second. Let's just say a person who struggles with the idea of killing for food 
tends to be very focused on the individual animal. And the person who stewards the species through conservation efforts like hunting tend to be more focused on the species health, not necessarily about the individual. So what you'll see very often is people will make choices that are bad for the species because they want to make choices that are good for the individual. You'll see this in sociology all the time. You see this with people all the time. It's like you, you make a choice that is good for one, but bad for all. And so I think that sometimes they're so focused on, it's like when, when you remove an individual from the population, we have this idea in biology called non-additive mortality or compensatory mortality versus additive mortality. Compensatory mortality means, let me give you an example, in Maine here, we have 35,000 black bears. Every year, hunters kill about 3,000 black bears. That's less black bears than die of natural causes. It's non-additive mortality. We can kill those 3,000 bears every year. And actually what's happened in Maine is every year the bear population's grown. It's actually increasing even though we kill 3,000 bears. The animal rights activist is very focused on the individual bear that dies. Hunters are much more focused on the population of bears. And so what we've done, hunters have achieved this because our hunting money, our dollars spent on our tags, our dollars spent, there's an 11% tax on the hunting equipment that we buy that goes into conservation, we are putting all this money back in. That money has been used to grow the bear population through field work and habitat and all of this. We've been able to increase the bear population. So to me, the net benefit is better. It's like, I care more about bears than I do about a bear. Me eating a bear doesn't affect the population, but it does feel hard for somebody who's like, yeah, but that bear. And I get that. I get that. But that's not how I look at it. I'm looking at and I, and it gets harder when you look at I look at humans that way, too. It's like, hey, some people die. You know, that just happens like people die in all kinds of ways. It's sad. It's terrible when you're connected to that person at intimate level. But what's more important is humans in general. Sometimes you get the impression that someone would um, save an animal, even if it meant the loss of the species. It's an interesting moral question. So I think that one of the ways we've been talking today about ways people break down in these two sides, that's one of the sides is like, what's more important to you, deer or a deer? Because it's hunters who've actually been bringing back all the game in North America through a whole host of efforts, which I could explain, but don't want to bore you with. But we have been the ones working on conservation efforts to bring back animals that were largely extirpated um, from the continent. And now they're back, and it's hunters who did that. And we care about these animals. Oh, I'm... I, I definitely, um, I have some uh, line of questioning that I want to get into that I'm going to circle back to around that <clears throat> specifically because I, as I said, I've had the yeah. fortunate um, vantage point of seeing things from like a hippie Californian uh, also to spend a lot of time with my dad and his hunter rancher friends my whole life also in Colorado and seeing the reverence that they have for the management of land and wildlife. It's really fascinating. I definitely want to get into that uh, because I, I sense that many people living in cities that are, you know, um, with all the best intentions, get into activism around the conservation of animals, spend very little time really actually true. out with the people doing it on the land, which is interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that for sure. Um, in terms of, uh, like, what do you do, let's say, if if you're choosing to leave, live a plant-based lifestyle and, you know, you've decided that you feel better on a vegan diet for a period of time. <laughs> um, I mean, what do you yeah. do about your pets? You know, like if you have cats and dogs and you love them, do you think yeah. it's fair to try to put your dog on a broccoli diet or would your dog get a pass on animals being killed for your dog because you feel such it's a more leading, such a leading question <laughs> luke I've always found that such a leading question because you know the answer is to like that. yeah yeah i make my dog yeah, food right I'm so kind of, one of the things I'm, for I'm me kind of one of the things you'll hear from people when so sneaky like that. there's a huge movement of people who were vegans who are hunting now it's actually one of the fastest growing demographics at least from what i can tell you get a lot of foodies who followed Maybe they were vegans and then they end up, you see this very common pa pattern, vegans or vegetarians, they end up getting onto the paleo kind of diet. And before you know it, they're working their way back from the farmer's market to the field and they're wanting to, to hunt. Um, oh, I don't remember what I was going to say now. Um, 
Oh, that um, one of the things you'll hear those folks say oh, no, is like, I want to use um, the entire oh, animal. And it's very difficult to do that when you have no background in it. So let's say you were part of a native culture where that was something that was never lost. You might learn some of that. Although realistically, nobody uses every part of every animal. You'll hear, you know that saying you hear all the time, Native Americans used every part of the animal. It's like Native Americans had uses for every part of animals, but they didn't use every part of every animal. It's so unrealistic, so ridiculously unrealistic, but it's an aesthetic that a lot of people bring when they start hunting. Um, it's difficult to do because in the beginning you don't even know what to do with the meat itself, no less like what to do. What do I do with the spleen? It's like very, conf- you know, so it takes a while to learn all that. One of the benefits of having a dog has been that I'm able to take all the stuff I don't, a lot of the stuff I don't use and I make my dog food. So two, three days ago here, um, I had 75 pounds of meat and fat and organs thawing in my bathtub and, uh, and grind, I grind it all, I run it through a mixer, and I make individual bags of dog food, and those will last about three months, and then I'll do it again. So when I'm, I take out of the animal what I'm gonna use, and what me and my wife are gonna use, and everything else, the bones, for instance, that I'm not, if I'm not using a bone for stock, obviously we keep bones for ourselves too, um, but my dog literally eats them, eats them, like, like chews them up, they're gone at the end, like little shards will remain of certain very osteous parts of those bones, but otherwise, my dog eats them. Them. My dog is a carnivore. If I try to give, just earlier today, I was eating a piece of broccoli. It's like winter here. I'm not really foraging much plants, you know. I have some wild plants that we've been able to put up for the winter, but you know, at this point of the year, like I'm like everybody buying food, and I'm just offering this piece of broccoli to my dog, you know, and she'll come over because she thinks all magic goodness flows from my hands, right? I think my dog imagines that I can just conjure treats in my hands. Like I don't think she fully understands I have to get them, you know. She just if something's moving to my hand, she wants to check it out. Right. So I, I'll hold out the broccoli and she comes over and she sniffs it. And then she does this funny thing. She t- like turns her head away. It's like just not food for her, you know, not food for her. Now my dog will eat grass. My dogs will eat a, my dog will eat a house plant if she's having digestive problems. So I think that dogs have times where they want plant fiber, but my dog is not a vegetarian. Dogs are wolves. Cats are ob- obligatory. They are obligate carnivores. I mean, it's really interesting. I had this uh, guest on my show recently, Deb Perkins, who uh, lived her or her career was as a bear biologist and um, did some amazing work. It's a very cool podcast if you're interested in learning about bears um, and the real story kind of about how she's cool, right? Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So at the end, though, she wanted oh, to yeah, talk listen, that one this piece. Came out, right? She really wanted to talk about yeah, the yeah. loss of songbirds yeah, like here in the United episode. States. Well, a huge part of that is because of cats, right? It's like house cats. Like you can feed your cat a vegetarian diet, and then your house cat goes out and kills songbirds. The number of the number of birds that are dying in the United States because of house cats is so outrageous that if people understood it, we would start to put regulations on cats. And what's the solution? You can keep your cat in the house. You can have like a prisoner cat. I mean, what's the what's the solution? You know, these are carnivores that have we've adapted, barely domesticated, adapted to our homes. They're not vegetarians. So if you want to want a vegetarian cat, you better lock that cat in the house. Because these animals, you see, you just take a little laser beam and move it on the floor and you see that cat goes instantly into hunt mode, right? The idea that you're going to feed your animals a vegetarian diet, I think, is animal abuse. Um, pretty simple, you know? I, I'm not massively affected by it, but I do think it's abuse. And and it leaves open a question. I don't think we need to explore it, but it's like if humans are omnivores, is feeding a child a vegan diet abuse? Um, I think at one point in the future, we may have laws pertaining to that. We'll see how it goes. But but studies are kind of coming out now showing that, hey, this might not be really good for kids. So it's interesting. It's not just with your pets, you know? Showing that, hey, this might not be really good for kids. So it's interesting. It's not just with your pets, you know? Well, in terms of the uh, health implications of certain fat soluble nutrients that are derived from uh, animal sourced foods i've always found it interesting and again coming from someone that you know i wasn't raw vegan like you for 10 years but vegetarian is that i've thought about well if you need to take certain supplements in order to kind of prop up that diet and if you're raising a kid on the diet for moral reasons or what you you believe to be um you know optimal health 
a strategy and you have to supplement, there's kind of an indication there that perhaps that's not have all the things you need. The optimal diet because <clears throat> optimal diet wouldn't need to be propped up by exogenous <clears throat> synthetic B vitamins, you know, vitamin A, et cetera, some of those things that come from animal food. So I always, I find that interesting. And, you know, again, someone that's coming from that world also and was just kind of like wow when i started drinking bone broth and kind of eased my way back into animal foods i just started feeling so much better and i've met so many people i mean so many so many people and i'm sure you have even to a higher degree um in in your career in life it's a cool but, place man um, that's I'll that like kind of they also like it's a restaurant too like a burger and, joint right start chatting with someone cool spot. yeah i'm like kind of they also it's a restaurant too like yeah, they have a well. They have a it's, they have a farm up in Shasta, and I actually want to get into that a little bit. Um, and that's where I get my meat because I know where it comes from. I've been to the farm. I've been to the slaughterhouse. It's as close as I can get as like an urban dude to being connected to my food <laughs> without going out and hunting in San Bernardino Mountains or something. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, I'll run into people there, and 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 oftentimes they're they're younger women and. You know, we'll just start chatting. Oh, I have a podcast, this and that. We start talking about health and food. And um, I've met many a recovering vegan that um, those two most common issues, I think, mm -hmm. that seem to take place is that they become infertile. They stop menstruating and their hormones just get wrecked. And then I've also met a number of other people whose teeth begin to turn. Yeah, or they have children that are born and when their teeth rot, come in, their teeth are already rotting or already um, decaying as they come through the gum line. I've seen that too. You know, and the vegans will say, the vegans will say, well, they weren't yeah, doing so the right, that's they weren't doing back it back right. To my own it's like, moral well, dilemma. if it's that hard to do, is this, can it be a natural good thing? You know, shouldn't it be, why is it that if they just ran, like that doesn't happen if you just even eat like random CAFO beef, that doesn't happen. So how, how is it so hard to do it right? You know, that's an interesting question. Like, why would it be so hard to, to figure out the right balance of what you need to mix together to to pull it off? You know, that's that's <laughs> that's interesting. And I think the, the reason that I first went vegetarian was. A, because I just, I started to get into spirituality and meditation. I started to become more conscious, more compassionate, more in touch with my heart and the idea of an animal having to suffer so that I could be full and have a tasty meal just didn't jive with me. And then as I started to learn more about health, this is going back in the mid nineties when I was doing this experiment. And um, at that time, you, you, the availability of farmers markets and knowledge about pasture raised animals and animals that are raised more naturally on their natural diet was there was a lot, less sure then, there a lot less farmers markets and things and on the fringes, but it wasn't known. So there it's was like, a lot less then, a lot less. yeah, either you were a vegetarian or vegan or you ate factory farm meat. And I remember seeing a documentary I remember. back in the day called, I think it was called earthlings. And it was this sort of animal animal cruelty kind of propaganda film and they had all these um hidden camera you know hidden camera footage of just animals being treated horrifically in these factory farms and i was just i i'm not i can't support this i'm gonna eat just indian food and whatever you know like i'll eat anything to not participate in that and so i think that's you know where a lot of people now think of all animal foods being raised in a way that's so unconscious and so demonic, frankly, that they're just like opting out of the whole thing. What I've been able to experience without going as far as you have into, you know, the landscape um, and doing things in a truly natural way, but is getting a visceral relationship with my farms, you know, like specifically Bel Campo. I went there and, you know, went to their slaughterhouse and went yeah, and touched yeah. the pigs that would eventually become quite possibly the bacon I'm cooking in my kitchen and I, I really got a you know like a, on a spiritual level I had to be able to be okay with that by getting as close as I could now when you go to the slaughterhouse because of USDA regulations you can't be in there when they're doing it but I saw the whole process and how it works and the 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 sense that I got too just on the slaughterhouse piece was that those cows that are being slaughtered that eventually end up in my refrigerator are actually suffering way less than an animal that dies of predation out in the wild right so like a deer that goes down eat because it a lot coyotes they're eating it, it well like, it's a lot it's a cow suffering a lot less eat than that alive. right eat right 
Right. So, so there were realizations of that nature there. But then I started to look at like, well, why even is that even being in that slaughterhouse going, ah, I get it. Like this is the lesser of evils and my body just, it's either me or them kind of thing. Like my body just breaks down if I don't eat this stuff. So it's kind of like, well, I'm not going to go like orthorexic and torture myself and have my health decline so that a cow doesn't die. I kind of had to choose. But then I started looking at, well, why, you know, does my dad have such an easy time taking the life of an animal, and he's also a very compassionate, kind, uh, intelligent person. And why is this so hard for me? And I, I kind of went back to, and I think you've talked about this, that because I, did, I wasn't part of the food system uh, in that sense in a natural way when I was very young. In other words, I wasn't being breastfed in a you know tribal setting as a hunter gatherer and watching chickens just get their heads cut off and gutted all day around me <laughs> so that those chickens didn't become like a little chick I saw in a cartoon and even when I went bear hunting with my dad when I was a kid and they I, I forget if I think they just they either killed or chased away the mama bear and so two cubs you know got treed basically in a really tall evergreen type tree and uh and my dad's buddy went up with a chainsaw and just sawed off the oh, top okay. of the tree to get them down to kind of set them free or whatever and one of them got impaled on the way down and just blood and guts everywhere and i'm looking at a baby bear and what i'm seeing as a kid was like my teddy bears i'm seeing yogi bear i'm seeing you this walk. human <laughs> with fur and that's a little more buff and walks on all fours you know yeah and he walk and it's like ah, oh, it was just like it was a horror show and then we ended up ta one of the bears lived we ended up taking it home and Damn, raising it that mom would have come back for those cubs yeah, i don't kennel, understand and that it was story like really, but a pet bear until it got too big yeah, to do that i'm curious what happened yeah yeah, I'll have to ask my dad what what exactly happened because okay. may, maybe they because yeah. I don't we didn't take the mama bear home. Yeah, just, just for people so, listening, I mean, like we a, have a strong ethic mother in the bear, bear would never just bail never on shooting her cubs. A, so I gotta cubs, ask him what happened. And we don't shoot cubs. I mean, that's just really like a clear ethic that's there. So I just want to make sure that I tease that apart. Those subtleties there. Yeah, go on. Thank you. So. Um, it's a long way of saying that I, I still have yet to completely reconcile the fact that I feel the need to eat animal products, but I'm still uh, okay, how a about bit this? disconnected like, from well, it. And I'm, 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 I just, where you if are, I could just jump in on it, because I think I kind of get example, where this is going. If you saw where your iPhone was being produced, yeah, you'd be like, mm, I can't really be a part of this. Like when you see the conditions that people are working in, if you saw where the materials for that were coming from, you'd be like, man, this is like, there's a lot going on. The fashion industry. How about that? Like if we actually went and saw the pollution, the affluent coming out of the, you know, textile mill where our clothes are produced, we'd be like, oh, well, there's a lot going on in the world that we are not accustomed to seeing. We get only the shiny packaging, right? One of the big differences is a lot of those things are extremely destructive and there's no precedent for them. But hunting is this thing that goes back millions of years for our species. I mean, chimpanzees hunt today, right? Our closest relative. Um, we have done this since we were, um, before our genus even came into existence, right? When we were Australopithecines, right? They were scavenging and potentially hunting. And then as soon as Homo comes on the scene, our genus, we're hunting. So that's a natural thing. And when we see that, it's really shocking to us. But there's a lot of things that'd be shocking to us if we just saw what was underpinning our lifestyle. So I think it's like part of it has to do with desensitization that, that naturally occurs. But but there's a lot of things that if we saw them, we would be pretty shocked and people just go about their days. Right. Um, when it comes to see, yeah, man, there's an old movie about that called Metropolis. Yeah, yeah. It's really Ignor fascinating. Ignorance is you know? bliss. Kind um, of thing. Yeah, like yeah. an old black and white silent film. Um, the, the thing about the gore side of it, when you first go out hunting, like in the beginning, it's quite shocking because you have this like childlike mind. It's never seen the stuff, right? And I think what it is is it brings you face to face with the fact that you are made of the same stuff, right? Your meat and organs and bones. And you're like, oh, that's me. I'm super, I'm made of jelly here. I'm really vulnerable. I could, this could happen to me. It's kind of like you have to really face that stuff down. And in the beginning, it's like you're cringing because you've been sheltered from this thing. 
I mean, how comfortable were you the first time you had sex? Your heart's beating really fast. You're nervous. You're like feeling like you're, yeah, like all this weirdness. You've never done it before. All these emotions are going through you. The first time that you hunt and you successfully harvest an animal, it's like an altered state of consciousness. You have all these emotions come through you. In part, your um very happy and excited in part you're uh, unsure of how you feel about what you've done and you're emotional in part you're um feeling connected to your ancestry and in part you're worried about how people are going to receive it and you want to take a photo but you're not sure if that's ethical you're like you know i don't want to be one of those guys but I kind of do want i want to commemorate this moment and you want to take time and look at the animal but you don't want the people with you to think you're being weird and all this stuff is go you've got tears in your eyes but you're smiling and all this stuff comes over you right and of course the second time it's less and the third time it's less, and you start to just integrate the experience and eventually you're like it doesn't phase you anymore i remember my wife you know who's a who's a elementary school teacher from canada okay so that kind of gives some perspective like she probably didn't, you know this is not what she grew up around she's in montreal um working with kids for a whole career and i remember in the beginning when she would see some of this stuff it was so hard for her to look at and now you know she'll come out to the garage where i'm cutting you know i'm taking skinning off a deer hide and i'm breaking the animal down and it's like we're just talking and she's hanging out now it didn't take that long before that like gruesome horrific side of it suddenly doesn't look that way at all and one of the really interesting things is when there's there's a certain point in the processing of an animal where the animal goes from looking like the animal to looking like what you think of as food so like you break a turkey down right and it's like feathers and it's face and it's beak and it's feet and all that and it's like man that's an animal once you get that skin off it and the head off and the feet off it you're looking at what looks like a butterball from thanksgiving and you don't feel emotional about that anymore you feel like that's food you know so yeah yeah, it's really interesting, right? So eventually, you, those you things hungry. get reconnected <laughs> yeah, in your mind the way they were meant to be connected. <laughs> and, right. you know, I mean, it'd be kind of similar to like if you and I were taking a walk through the forest, right? And I was just like irreverently bending over and ripping plants out, pulling them right up from the roots and just tossing them behind me, man. You'd be like, dude, knock that off. Why are you doing that? Like, why are you just randomly killing plants? But you go into the garden and you see people do that. And you're like, well, no, that's because that's our food. Right. But I would be bothered personally. It would emotionally bother me to watch you just pull up plants from the ground. I'd be like, man, that's a living thing. Stop it. Or if you were just ripping mushrooms off trees, but you weren't you, I'd just be like, stop it. But if you were harvesting them for food, I wouldn't feel that way. That would be normal to me. You know what I'm saying? And it's very similar. When you harvest animals for food, it's a very different thing. I mean, I understand why people are bothered by the idea of, of hunting for pure trophy. I can understand why that bothers people. There's a lot of nuance and complexity to that that I don't think people have really worked through. Um, and they should know about because there are certain animals on the planet that without the hunting of them, those animals will probably go extinct soon. The rhino is an example of that. The elephant is an example of that. It is actually hunting, which is funding the remaining conservation of those animals. As shocking as that may be for people to hear, it's true, um, or at least in large part. Oh, because the yeah. Because well, in Africa, Africa is not set up the same way as it so is here, right? Africa is a really there's Africa is a very generated. different place. And um, what you'll have is, in, as an example, will be you'll have a, a big boar elephant, right? A big male elephant who um, is no longer um, really breeding and is becoming a threat either to people or to other elephants and they'll decide they're going to take that one out of the population uh, sorry bull elephant i don't always say bull elephant a uh, big bull elephant then they'll sell a tag for a hunter he'll pay thirty forty thousand dollars for that elephant and that money then goes back into the conservation of the rest of those elephants that's where you're left with like oh do i care more about the individual elephant or do i care more about elephants you know it's interesting right and you know <clears throat> yeah well that's the case that's a, wow. a lot of it is this way yeah, where you trippy. think it's really simple yeah, well, i mean how many things have you ever had a strong opinion on and then you find out it's way more nuanced than you realize and you feel kind of like a fool because you're like oh man i was i should have kept my mouth shut i didn't realize how complex this is you know we've been faced since 2016 with about 30 issues like that in our country 
right? Where, you know, you go like, oh, well, that's a strong polarizing thing and I already know how I feel. And then you start to realize, oh, it's way more complicated. You know, I should probably approach this a little bit more gently. So, yeah, things are really not so simple, man. And uh, and one thing I want to say too, and I think people get confused about this with animals. A lot of people think like if you don't hunt that animal, it's just going to like live forever. It's like, man, they, they don't. And I hate to tell you, a turkey is going to live about three years. A four-year-old turkey is like a 110-year-old person, right? They are so heavily preyed upon by so many species that they have adaptations to that predation, right? They are overproducing offspring as a resistance to the heavy predation. A seven-year-old deer would be like, wow, that's an old deer, right? Oh, yeah, man. People are like – you know, somebody shoots a buck in the last year oh, of his really? life and people wow. freak out. And it's like, do you know what was going to happen that winter to that deer? When, like you said, the coyotes eat him alive or he starves to death on the landscape because he's incapable of getting enough food anymore when he's in his decline. Like, would you re- – it's like an interesting thing. Like, would you – if you had the choice, like, you could be shot by a gun and die – and then um, respectfully brought home and cared for, or you could be eaten alive, or you could freeze to death in starvation. Like, which would you choose? You know what I mean? It's an interesting concept. So, yeah, animals just don't go on living forever because people <laughs> yeah, don't totally. hunt them. I mean, yeah. they, they have very finite lifespans, and they live very challenging lives, and they, unless they are apex predators, they are dealing with predation on their landscape. Humans are just one small fraction of the overall predation landscape. Um, and we are predators, man. I mean, we have eyes in the front of our face for a reason. We are pred- pred- predator species. In addition, what's so cool about us is we're like bears. We're omnivores. That's what's so cool. So like I said before, you get this thing of like, well, should we be right wing or left wing? Should we be conservative or should we be liberal? Should we be, li- should we be religious or should we be atheist? Should we be vegan or should we be carnivores? It's like, man, we're not vegans or carnivores. We're omnivores. I think the middle path applies in so many of these polarizing things. And the more you go to one side, the more you're going to get the other extreme. So like veganism took things really far one way. And now you have these paleo and carnivore diets popping up all over where you live. How many people now are on these carnivore diets where it's like, I just want to be like, really a carnivore diet. I mean, could you, it's, I just want to be like, really. yeah, <laughs> my brother's yeah, right. on He's it. on it for three years. Wow. That's so long. He hasn't had a cold. That's so like long. Cause years. humans have been omnivores for three and a half million years. So his three years yeah. sure. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. <laughs> eventually he, I'll just tell you right now, I hate to break this to you or to him. Cause yeah, I, yeah, I like yeah. your brother a lot. Um, but it's like, you're not going to be, to him, oh, okay, I don't know. I, All right, cool. Like All right, cool. So um, I don't have to feel as bad. So it's my other it's brother, like, uh, Andy, not Cody, by the way. I don't know if you He met will him, not yeah. be on the carnivore diet for very long. Cody's an omnivore still. 10 years is not very long. I was a vegan for 10 years. That's not that long. I've lived 41 years, so so overall, it's a lot less than half. So it's a short-term experiment, and nobody can sustain that. There's never been – even the Inuit people in the Arctic latitudes in the summer, what do you think they're doing? They're foraging plants. They're not living just up. There's no time in history where that's what people were doing. People think too like, well, during the Ice Age, we were on a carnivore diet. It's like, oh, what were the herbivores that we were hunting eating? People think too like during the Ice Age. What the fuck? I mean, seriously, people love these extremes. So like I said before, when this this right wing versus left wing thing, I'm like, man, I'm taking the middle path because I agree with the liberals on a lot of stuff. I agree with the conservatives on a lot of stuff. I don't want to have to pick one. I have two brain hemispheres. Vegan or carnivore? Are you kidding me? We're omnivores. We're like bears. We, we really like meat when we can get it. And we really like plants. I like to eat salad. I also like to eat meat and I'm not going to do this silly TikTok extreme thing anymore that I was so drawn into and so many of us were drawn into in the past, you know? And when you go out into nature, man, and you start to like, like you want to test your diet, go into nature, try it out there. Because vegans like have this idea that, well, I would just walk around out there and pick plants. It's like, well, why don't you try that? I invite you to come along and try that because you're going to find that it's not actually how you think it is. People have very cartoonish ideas about nature. 
they aren't participating. So anybody living in the urban environment who doesn't have deep immersion into nature should probably not talk so much about what they think it's like out there until they go get some experience. I mean, it's like I shouldn't probably talk too much about how to fix cars. I just don't have experience with it. So I'll let the mechanics handle that. You know, like I'm, I don't, I don't know, you know what I mean? It would be foolish. Like I'm not, I don't spend my day in the garage working on cars. I, I do happen to go out into nature to get my food. So I think I can at least throw my opinion out there a little bit because I have some experience with it and it's not what carnivore diet people think. And it's not what vegan people think. It's different. It's both. And it's not what carnivore diet people think. And it's not what vegan people think. It's different. It's both. Going back to the desensitization and the fact that we've become so, um, you know, disconnected from nature and from our sources of food. And as I was describing, seeing that, that dead uh, bear cub and seeing, you know, Yogi the bear and my teddy bear and all of that, and just not being indoctrinated into those sort of visuals and that experience. I've, I've thought about it from another angle, too, in that when you're... <laughs> when you kill an animal and you open an animal's insides and you see what's on the inside, I think many of us, including myself, the only <laughs> time we've seen an organism's insides have been in horror movies. So I think the first yeah, time I absolutely. ever saw a mammal cut open would have been like yeah. in the Friday the 13th movie that yeah. I, I still probably have nightmares about. So I think there's like a correlation between horror films and scary things and evil and demonic have you ever watched a horror movie with the soundtrack of off and you're like oh this isn't really scary thought about that that that's like another it's like not that scary right so media has this is like hypnosis oh, you've got right. audio and visual stimulation working together right if you remove it it's interesting making my show because i get to see it with different music so we'll have a scene where it's like dun, 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 dun. and then we'll change that music out for something more um more serious or more somber and more reverent and it'll be like completely different scene right the, it, media's played with these different aspects of our psychology so you had blood and guts associated with fear now the thing is is when you watch children grow up around hunting I mean, two years right. old, three years old, they have no problem putting their hands into an animal. They have no problem gutting an animal, cleaning an animal. This is not inherently hard for humans. It's inherently hard for humans who have been sheltered from it. But it's not hard for kids at all. If they've grown up around it, it's so normal to them. It's like every day. Now, that said, there's a science around cuteness. Okay, that's an interesting thing. It's neoteny. We've talked about neoteny on, um, before together. Okay, big eyes, things. floppy ears, like pouty face, big lips, all these things that we associate with mammal babies is what we think of as cute, right? So if you look at the emojis that are meant to be cute or cartoons that are meant to be cute, you'll see that they exaggerate childlike features and that evokes the sense of oh, cuteness and compassion in us as it should, man, because that's why we want to take care of babies, right? That's why if like you or me are walking down the street and we see a baby left alone, what are you, the first thing you're doing, what? Like if it was like, uh, like actually abandoned, you know, like scoop that thing up and care for it, man. You might even risk your life to do it, right? You might put yourself at risk to do it. I would do that for a bear cub too. I'm not cold to this. I see a bear cub in that situation you're talking about, man. That's going to be really hard for me, because that's I don't that's I don't I don't want to. I would take care of that cub, right? And you'll see this too. Like I see a lot of imagery of um, of indigenous people in. I see it a lot from South America where they've taken on some kind of pet a monkey or, you know, a, a parrot of some kind. Animals that they would eat and do eat, but for some reason will also keep and care for in certain circumstances. It's not mutually exclusive, man. It's not left or right. It's both can be true. I can care for baby bears. I care about bears, man. I personally think I care more about bears than people who sit in cities talking about how they care about bears. I mean, I interact with black bears. I mean, how many bears does the average person ever even encounter in their lifetime? They'd be lucky to see one cross the road. You know, they're not involved in the, you know, so anyway, I, I just think it's like, 
you're right. Horror movies have shaped, media has shaped so many aspects of how we interact with the world. And media has been shaping this idea that vegetarians are more um, compassionate people and that meat eaters are horrible people. I mean, we're, that's being shaped by media to this day. We have caricatures and, and stereotypes that have persisted through media. We have caricatures and stereotypes that have persisted through media. It's interesting, the piece about the music, you know, because I know so much of media, films, television, etc., is about programming you, right, to sell you something, or in some cases in training your brain just to be entertained and sort of distracted from the mundane life that you might live. And I was thinking as you were saying that, uh, going back to your show and thinking like when you took those turkeys down. That's how so much Slayer hunting media the is. For it, Partially like, making oh, this is the show, cool. man. Because you know? what you have is the people who've been making hunting <laughs> yeah, media have been making it from a perspective. You know, a lot of people will say, back to what we were talking about before, a lot of people will say, uh, I don't agree with hunting. Um, however, uh, I do agree with native peoples taking it because I believe they were more reverent and compassionate and they used the animal respectfully right that's like a very common thing that you'll hear i have found that if i present hunting in the way that i see it which is for food primarily first thing it's for food and second it's done with respect that most people go like okay i respect that i can get with that but when you see it presented in the in the stereotypical way that it's been presented for so long, I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty, I find it off putting. When I see like a, you know like heavy music being played where it's like this Red Bull Mountain Dew aggressive like testosterone fueled you know conquest all about your ego, that's pretty off putting to me. You know, I mean, I don't I don't like that, and that's not how I I don't perceive it that way. It's why I get really turned off when people say to me. Um, when they refer to hunting as a sport, I just really don't, I don't like that. I don't, this is not a sport for me. It's, it'd be like if you, if I said, oh, you know, that sport you do, um, meditation, you'd be like, oh no, that's like not a sport, right? But like somebody could perceive it that way or somebody's yoga practice that they're really diligent about as a personal tool for their evolution and spiritual growth, let's say. And I was like, oh man, you're in that yoga sport. They'd be like, dude, it's not a sport, man. It's a practice. I hunt and gather as a practice. This is my practice for re-engaging with the natural world and having a real world. Look, people are talking about going to Mars. We're at this time now where people are talking about leaving the planet and terraforming Mars, terraforming the moon. I think it's so important now to have a relationship with planet Earth. It's like the idea of destroying this planet and then just jumping to the next one. You know, I know that's not happening next year or anything, but that's the conversation that's taking place, right? People like Elon Musk pushing that conversation forward. It's like, to me, it looks a lot like leaving a bad relationship because you're not willing to do the work. To me, you know, you got relationship problems. You're not willing to do the work, so you're jumping to the next one. We don't, we don't like. My question is this: What are you going to do on Mars? Are you going to bury the garbage in the ground again? We don't, we don't. Are you going to strip mine it, like we did here? We're going to just then have to jump to the next. Now we're going to Venus, because like what? Like we can't fix our relationship with this planet. Now a lot of people who don't have a relationship to this planet would benefit massively for de- to, from developing a relationship with the earth that's why to me hunting and foraging is not a sport i don't hunt as a sport i hunt as a practice to develop that relationship with the earth because i see that as like the big missing piece right now for people and we're heading towards transhumanism in a big way we're heading towards virtual and augmented realities in a big way we're talking about leaving our planet to colonize other places and we have not worked on the relationship with this planet and i i just think like i don't see how people are going to do that from the urban environment and that doesn't mean they can't live there or you know and i'm not i know this isn't for everybody you brought up earlier the, the issue of scalability right i get this thing all the time people will go they'll try to illegitimize what i'm doing by saying not everybody can do it and i'm kind of like what can everyone do can everyone on planet play golf how many golf courses would we need why are you not out at the golf course being like you should stop playing golf not everyone can play golf why are you not out at the golf course being like you should how many things are like that not everybody can have an electric guitar it's just not realistic no more electric guitars 
it's like well not everyone can hunt man so it's not like why are you out there it's like i'm just sharing what i'm doing it's what i'm passionate about and there's a lot of room for people to get on board there's a lot of room there's a lot of vacant seats here so plenty of people can hop on board i'm not going to saturate it the management systems in place for hunting in north america are so solid this the the greatest game management system that's ever been developed it's called the North American model of game management. It's incredible. Um, we have lots of room, and so yes, not all seven billion people can do it, but not all seven billion people can do almost anything that we do. You know, as far as activities or recreation or whatever it is. So, um, I think that people put an undue burden on it. It's a way they're legitimizing it, so they don't have to look at it. You know. In terms of the health profile and the nutrient density of wild foods, I'm curious as to what your subjective experience has been now that, you know, depending on the season and resources that you have available, it seems like a lot of your diet for the past few years has been coming from your landscape. Have you noticed subjectively any changes in your health, issues that have been resolved, uh, feeling more energy, more resilient? What's the difference between, you know, the best organically raised produce and pasture raised animals that you'd get from, you know, a nice supermarket like Whole Foods or wherever versus the yeah. nutrition? Let's take it. We'll animals. break it down into a couple different pieces here. Land. When it comes to plants, there's really no question. The science is very established. Wild plants are far richer in nutrients than their domesticated counterparts almost always. Particularly, uh, I just put out a podcast yesterday with uh, the forager chef, Alan Burgo. Really cool dude. One thing he kept talking about, he talks about wild plants are real plants doing real plant things. And he was he gets real burned about the idea of like uh, microgreens like they put on stuff in the restaurants, you know? And he was, he, he, did, yeah. he gets so mad about that. But this idea of real plants doing real plant yeah, things, I, what does I that mean? That it means one, like, yeah. 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 Uh, your dog is weaker than the wolf that it comes from because the wolf deals with hot and cold. The wolf deals with extreme conditions. The wolf deals with the actual environment. The wolf has to be smart and alert. No one is putting a bowl of food in front of the wolf each day. The wolf is stronger than the dog. You might have a real strong dog, or you might have a real weak dog, right? So you might have a dog that's much closer to the wolf, and that dog is strong, but not as strong as the wolf. And you might have a really weak dog, like a little lap dog that kind of is super, super needy, right? It's like this. Yeah, well, I'm sure it fills its role well, you know, yeah, I got uh, one right full here. respect. But um, <laughs> similarly, the wild plant's going to be the strongest because it's a real plant doing real plant things. Again, I'm stealing that from my friend Alan. It's living outside under extreme UV. It's dealing with wind blowing it around. No one's putting a fence around it. No one's fertilizing it. No one's watering it. No one's taking care of it. So it becomes vigorous and strong. In the process of doing that, it has to create all of these phytochemicals that protect it from the process herbivorous insect predation uh macro herbivores too large you know large organisms mammals and such birds it has to um produce chemicals that protect it against sunlight so that it doesn't get scorched and those chemicals tend to be medicinal to us or they tend to be antioxidant to us and you get much more of them than the plant that's been grown now this also some of the plants we grow are much closer to the wild plant and some are really weak, right? So here's a cool example. Asparagus is like an almost wild plant. Now you see wild asparagus, it just looks like the asparagus in the store. Now you'll note that asparagus is a plant that's hard to find all year in your store for that very reason seasonal but you can also get that asparagus they grow under a dark covering and it's like have you ever seen it? it's like an albino asparagus it's all right okay that would be like the lap dog version of asparagus yeah it's very weak versus of course i want the asparagus with more chlorophyll uh, obviously that would be like more like the dog that's close to the wolf like the german shepherd or whatever you know the alaskan malamute let's say you know so some t some plants are in their cultivated form are still super nutritious, right? There's a lot of fantastic. I always like I've been this big fan of chia seeds forever. Chia seeds are so similar to a wild food um, in their nutrition profile. They're like really strong and vigorous still, even though we cultivate them. 
but some of the things we grow have gotten pretty weak. So that's something to consider. But wild plants always top the list for antioxidant value, for nutrient value, across the board, fiber, all of that. Also, sugar to fiber ratio is usually much better in the wild food than it is in the cultivated food. Now, when it comes to animals, things are a little better in the wild food. Daniel, let, let, before you move on to animals, what are some of the weak apples, sauce? Dude. Hybridized, apples are the worst, man. Not I just filmed the whole episode. Most of my shows have hunting okay. and foraging kind of combined in the episode. I just did for season two a whole episode on apples. I got some friends in New York, Red Kill Mountain. Check them out on Instagram, on the, on the web. Um, Red Kill Mountain. Kill is a, a Dutch word, I guess, for um, creek or brook. So it refers to... Uh, the, the the area they're in, all the brooks are called kills. Um, so this guy, basically what he did was he was looking for an investment property. It's quite a long story. He ends up kind of stuck with this property and realizes he's got a couple thousand wild apple trees. Now, apples are really unique because if you take, picture you go to the store, like name an apple variety you might buy at your supermarket, like pick one. Take your Granny Smith and you cut it like hemispherically like this, right? Granny so you Smith. cut it sagittally or transverse, I mean, and flip it open and you got those like five little compartments and typically you're going to have five seeds in there, right? Every one of those seeds will produce a different apple. None of them will be a Granny Smith. Probably none will even resemble a Granny Smith. It will immediately return to like wild genetics. Okay. That is true. Now, picture you've got a tree with Granny Smiths on Whoa, it, right? So you've no got, way. let's say conservatively, That's you've got crazy. 300 apples on the tree. Okay. If you've got 300 apples, let, let's make it simpler. You got 100 apples and you got five seeds in each apple. Now, sometimes you're going to have as many as 10 seeds in an apple. Sometimes you get a couple seeds per compartment. But let's say, just generally, you got five seeds in the apple and you got 100 apples, right? So now you've got like 500 apple seeds. Everyone's going to produce a different apple tree. You're going to end up with 500 unique apple cultivars. None of them will be predictable. Some will be bitter, some will be sweet, some will be tannic, some will be russeted, some will be red, some will be purple, some will be pink fleshed, some will be green, some will be yellow, all different, okay? You can't predict it, which means you can't plant orchards from seed, because if you do, you don't know you'll get apples that people will want to eat. So how do we produce apples then? We, cl we clone them. We take Granny Smith cuttings. At one point, one of these seeds produced a wild Granny Smith apple, a pippin. That's an apple tree grown from seed. One produced a Granny Smith, and somebody said, this is awesome. I'm going to clone this. So they made cuttings, and they grafted it. And then over time, what you end up with is that you end up with a supermarket full of all of these cloned apples. They all tend to be high sugar right? They all tend to be um, oversized. They all tend to be really robust in the shipping process, but you lose so much fiber. You lose so much flavor. You use, you lose so much diversity. It's like that whole thing, celebrate diversity. We're not doing that with apples. And if, if the average person was invited to eat cloned animal food, they would probably not want it. You'll have some contrarians who'd be like, I don't care, don't have, don't mean anything. But most people are going to be like, yeah, I'm not really digging the cloned you know, fish. I'm not really digging the cloned cow or the cloned sheep. But people are eating cloned apples every day. Um, and that that's true of a lot of foods. I just want to give you that example of how kind of far off track we've gotten and how little we know. Johnny Appleseed, right? This dude was, what he was doing when people were headed westward, they were being given land by the federal government, right, to homestead. But in order to do it, in order to receive that land, they had to plant a certain number of fruit trees. So Johnny Appleseed was an entrepreneur selling people pippins. He believed for religious reasons that it was wrong to clone apple trees. And so he would plant apples from seed, hence his name Johnny Appleseed, and he was giving people pippins. And they were taking them out west and planting them on their land holding. So very fascinating story about a guy who was obsessed with the wild version of the fruit. Um, so there's an example, and that whole thing an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Uh, Joe Robinson in the book um, Eating on the Wild Side kind of reveals that actually studies done on an apple a day shows that your health declines if you eat a store-bought apple a day, it's particularly a red or a yellow delicious because their sugar content. So it's just not true. But wild apples, I was just in a savanna of uh, 2,000 wild apple trees and every apple tree that you select from has a different apple. So you're walking from tree to tree tasting radically different 
different fruits. It's incredible. It's an incredible experience. None the same. Um, so pretty special stuff. Um, there are plants like I mentioned before, um, asparagus. That is a very close to wild plant. Blueberry, very close. Not as good as the wild, but pretty close. Um, what else are some other examples? There's quite a few. Brazil nuts are like a wild plant. Sea vegetables that they're growing you know, now in aquaculture, still very close, grown in seawater. They're fantastic. So there's like a lot of stuff that you could pick from um, that's still really good. But there's some stuff that's gotten so far away from what it actually started off as. It's quite shut. As far away from what it started off as, as chihuahuas are far away from wolves. Um, on to, I think when you get to fish is one of the examples where you know just the wild thing is better wow. than the farmed thing. Aquaculture for fish is like uh, still in a pretty sloppy place and the quality of the food being turned out is hard to, it's not as good as the wild food. It's typically being fed things that increase its omega-6 fat content and decrease its omega-3 fat content. Um, they tend to be subjected to a lot more pharmaceuticals and environmental pollutants and they're living in close proximity. One of the problems is like when you stack and pack any kind of organism into a monoculture, they get sick. That's true of corn. It's true of cows. It's true of chickens. It's true of people. That's why our cities, people are so sick in them because um, they're people. So, um, you know, I think with fish, it's a great example. <laughs> when you get to like mammals, this is where you get a little, it's a little less compelling um, because, you know, your wild animal is going to have a lot higher omega-3 to omega-6, but people who raise cattle right on grass, they produce some pretty awesome meat. Like if you're hearing me and going like, man, that whole hunting thing's cool, but I'm not going to do it. It's like, man, you, you get a connection to a good organic or sort of, you know, biodiverse farm, um, a polyculture farm that raises meat. You get some really good stuff, but, um, you'll never have the story. Uh, you'll never sit down to that meal. No, you'll never have the story. You'll never really know. And there's something about that. It's like we sit down to eat, a meal here and I turn around and it's like hey there's the skull of this animal we're eating and here's the story of it and every time I eat that it's like a celebration of that animal's life um, that to me is something that you can't that's not a nutrient per se but it's something that you can't replace it's really powerful and it's something you can only know when you do it and, and when you share that with somebody too when you share that food with somebody yeah, it's like kind of you know it's really cool to have somebody over and you cook them a nice grass fed tenderloin but it's not the same as when you cook them you know a, a piece of beef I mean a piece of venison backstrap and you tell them the story of that animal and you share that that's a different thing altogether you know and you tell them the story of that animal share that that's a different thing altogether. well that's what that's what i got watching your show i was like god that food and i'm not you you know i'm not a big foodie it's more of a utilitarian you know necessary part of life i just want to do my thing food's more just something i have to do to stay alive but i don't typically get into it but there are times when i see food prepared in the way yeah. that you guys are like the story behind it and then you're seeing like this amazing culinary oh dude creativity. see that's one of the things that I'm like God, i'm trying to do more so stuff like, and i want to hang places. out with like, you and your friends one of dude. the goals in season it two we travel so a bit more good. i got to do a I'm whole like, episode oh. up in newfoundland i just got back from um i did a really fun episode with alan burgo i was talking about a minute ago where i was harvesting pigeons off this this corn organic corn farm i mean the the story i don't have time obviously we've been we're deep in i wish i could just talk for the next half hour about pigeons and how amazing yeah. Pigeons are. Oh, Rabbit trail. Dude. Pigeons are the do, original we poultry. Do they were the first domesticated bird. Just like hone this is on one. this was the original like chicken for people. The story of pigeons and the role that they played as the first internet, the first mail service, in addition to being food. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, pigeons are one of the most delightful foods you could imagine. Like if I could cook you some pigeons, man, you would be just over the moon. It's so good. Yeah, it really is. But anyway, so we shot that one in Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> really? I'm just getting ready to go down to Georgia. Wow. I want to do more episodes and more places because really, I could do a whole season of shows right based out of your house, man. That's what I want people to realize is we could probably take us an hour 
to drive out of your house and we could be filming whole episodes out there on what we can hunt, fish, and forage right in your landscape. And this isn't about like Maine. It's about everywhere. There's already systems in place that you maybe don't know how to tap into them yet, right? So part of what I'm doing, like I've just launched a program, and part of that program is to show people how to start getting involved where they are, you know, how to tap into the hunting, the fishing, and the foraging in your area because it's not about Maine. It's not about any particular place. It's about every place. And what I want, just like I was saying before, like I get confused by racism because I'm like, man, sh- aren't all races like equally awesome and shouldn't they all be celebrated for their like really cool, diverse ways they have adapted to the places that they were that they are land races from? Like, it's all so cool to me. Similarly, it's like, I want to celebrate the diversity of hunting, fishing, and foraging in all these different places because they're all cool. I'm just, I started off with season one doing a lot of the stuff that is local to me, but man, everywhere you go, there's really, really cool stuff you can get involved in. stuff that is local to me, but Man, everywhere you go, there's really, really cool stuff you get involved in. That's that's encouraging because because I'm not trained in your wild ways. When I go out into the natural landscape here yeah. in Southern California, for example, I don't see anything at all that I could eat. I know it's there. Yeah, oh, the yeah. only thing You're I ever see is I see uh, what I believe to be fennel. Yeah. Like these huge oh, yeah. fennel bushes. Oh, yeah, they, it smells like licorice. You know? I think <laughs> it it's is. fennel. I've eaten it and I haven't gotten sick, so I think it's that's probably what it is. <laughs> but I know there's, there's so much more there. Um, one thing I'm curious about, too, is I, mean, I could just dive into this shit forever because it's so fascinating. But so when you have wild fish and farmed fish, I think a lot of us are now um, aware to some degree that there's risk of contamination, right? PCBs, mercury on the wild fish side, the larger fish that are uh, living longer and bioaccumulating toxins. And then, you know, next thing you know, you've got high mercury, et cetera. And then with the farmed fish, feeding them GMO corn, soy, God knows what they're feeding them, dyes and things to make them turn pink. When you're dealing, and then of course in the the industrial food supply of animal foods, obviously antibiotics, all kinds of nasties going on there. In wild game, whether it be those pigeons or the iguanas you're getting off the side of the freeway, those invasive species that you're hunting in Florida, um, or even just deer off your landscape, is there? How much risk is there for if those deer were grazing on a glyphosate rich farm, or those pigeons were eating garbage with? pharmaceuticals in it and you know like how much contamination is there in those organs and the meat and if so is there a way to test for it or how do you know that those wild meats aren't tainted in some way i'm picturing your iguanas in florida like (laughs) eating you know rotten (laughs) twinkies out of somebody's garbage on the side of their house and now they're bioaccumulating all the yeah well iguanas first i'll just say you're eating them you know bioaccumulate all that much and i take them usually fairly young um but if i was i have a real interest in going down to the everglades to um hunt invasive pythons they are notoriously high in pcbs right so that's like a kind of thing where it's like i'm gonna have one meal one time i'm not eating that as a habit right that's like a kind of thing where it's like i'm gonna have because they're apex oh, predators. Oh, where, where so are they picking apex that predators up from? over the course of their lifetime are bioaccumulating just what's going on with fish. Like, for instance, oh. I fish from mackerel, a small, oily fish. Uh, this is one of the healthiest wild fish you can eat. I also like to eat striped bass, but striped bass eat those fish. And every mackerel has that tiny little bit, but after a while, they keep eating. As the bigger fish eat those fish, they bioaccumulate. That's what happens up the food chain, right? So this is an issue. One of the thing, it's one of the reasons why I'm presenting in this season of the show. A lot of hunters are going to laugh at my hunting. I'm not getting the big 12 point bucks. I'm not after the, you know. 1200 pound moose i care less about that because those are older animals right you with me on this nobody i know nobody i know goes to the farm and they say uh you know i'm looking for like a seven-year-old cow that's what i would like to eat like a seven-year-old bull everybody's eating a one to two-year-old animal they're eating chickens that aren't even a year old 
right? Most people don't realize they're eating babies all the time. <laughs> That's what we prefer. But then hunters are, because there's this ego thing involved, a lot of times they're after these big trophy animals. I'm like really, that occasionally I'll end up with those animals, but that's not what I'm really that interested in. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's an issue. Just like with our modern food supply, you have to um, navigate that. It's true of plants too. So, you know, one of the reasons that we don't harvest the bulbs off wild leeks where I live is because the river system that we're harvesting off of is still carrying a lot of contaminants from paper mills in the past. And so we don't take the underground portion of the plant. We just take the top portion. It's less, con- it doesn't have the contaminants. They don't make it up because of gravity. They literally don't make it up into the top of plants. So everything in our environment is polluted, whether we're getting it from farms or we're getting it from, you know, wild animals or whatever it is, right? It's like the challenge that we, it's like welcome to earth. But yes, if you're very concerned about that, you can navigate what you hunt and how you hunt. So um, in episode seven of Wild Fed season one, I harvest this little button buck, like a one-year-old deer. And I remember when I went, it's not in the show, but I would tag that deer. You know, you got to, if this is a whole controlled system, it's not like you're just out there, Elmer fudding around, shooting whatever you want, right? I got to bring this animal to the tagging station, have it legally tagged. And I get there and they're laughing at me. Like pretty small deer, ain't it? Like it's all like a, it's like a giant ego crash, right? And I'm just laughing like, you know how good this thing's going to eat? Are you kidding me? Like, again, like you wouldn't go to the farm and be like, yeah, I'll take that five-year-old rooster off your hands. That's going to make good eating. You're like, I want that little soft one. And so for some reason, when people hunt, they approach it a little bit differently. Um, But yeah, there's a lot of animals you could eat that'd be very healthy. And there's animals you need to understand the different, um, you know, pollution issues with. Um, Same as it is with our, same as it is when you go into the supermarket, man. And as you know, you could go into a really great health food store. You go into Erewhon, right? All like a lot of really good stuff there. And you know, there's certain things in there that you're like, I'm not touching that, but I will choose that. And so it's no different. This is the earth we live on. It's the same. So you might choose to fish for certain species and not other species. Now, there's a lot of stuff that people don't realize. Like, for instance, that the selenium levels um, in fish that live in the ocean, that that selenium buffers mercury. Like, that is like how many people are you hearing about with mercury toxicity from eating fish? It's not like a thing that actually is happening. It's like a theoretical thing. Very little mercury poisoning going on in people from seafood consumption. I'm not saying that can't happen, but it's not like this epidemic we're dealing with. And we know people are eating huge amounts of seafood. That said, I'm not going to fish in the cooling pond at Fukushima. You know what I mean? Like, so that's another component. Like, do I want to shoot deer, uh, you know, at the Monsanto cornfield? No, not really, you know? So you got to kind of like pick and choose where you do things, but it's no different than going to the supermarket now or even going to the farmer's market. I go down the farmer's market here and there's organic farms where that produce, you're just looking at it, you're like, no way, dude. How is it that big? You say organic, but like, that food, like I asked, I asked the farmer that I buy from, I go, why is that farm over there got such a gigantic, beautiful looking produce compared, no offense, but like compared to what you're growing here, she's like, well, that's all nitrogen. It's just plumped up with water. It's not, it's watered down flavor too. Like my, my food isn't as big and not as plump looking, but the flavor is like, like she's like older folks come here, buy my stuff and go, this tastes like what food used to taste like when I was a kid, because the flavors are concentrated. You can blow that thing up bigger. You get more for it. They're using whatever organic nitrogen fertilizers things get bigger but they're not necessarily better right so it's like even in the organic farmers market you got to kind of pick and choose what you buy and it's like when you go to whole foods and it's like everything in there such a small fraction of the food in there now is organic people just think like it's all good it's that whole food it's all good right and it's like man you could be buying the monsanto whatever there too so you you always have to navigate this so this is not a unique issue in wild foods it's just an issue in food so this is not a unique issue in wild foods it's just an issue in food so you you sort of look at the um as best you can the traceability of like the landscape that that animal has been living yeah on yeah yeah yeah, yeah. or or certain things where it's like chain of the i know that, that mackerel is a really healthy fish best to, to eat. discern yeah, yeah, yeah. i know that if i want to eat a wild swordfish i, know that I might want to be more sparing in how often i do that like i said before i like to eat striped bass a couple times a year I like to fish for them. I think they're a beautiful animal. They migrate up the coast, and the problem is they, they're they born and they breed down where PCBs were invented. So they pick up a lot of that. I'll only eat a couple of them, and I'll try to eat the smallest ones that I can legally keep. So if I get the real gigantic one, that's probably not the good food one, right? 
but that's the same as like i said you also don't want to eat the old bull on the farm either Right. You know, but the old breeding like bull. Said, it's the same. So, so like, if you wanted to take a picture with an animal yeah. to be like, look how cool this is, you probably want that picture with so that like, giant bull, not with the young calf. But if it's going to come down to what you're going to eat, you probably want to eat the young calf. And so, hunting's been riddled with this ego pride stuff that I'm just I'm not really tied up in that, so I don't care as much. So, so yeah, I'm typically eating younger animals, and then I'm I'm aware of. And this is the same with plants, man. It's the same with mushrooms. Mushrooms are notorious. Wild mushrooms are notorious for uptaking things like heavy metals from the environment so it matters where you harvest them from and the thing is is you go to the nice high-end restaurant that's got foraged mushrooms and you don't know is it where were they you put an economic value you start paying foragers to get stuff they're willing to get them wherever they can get them right so when you go out and get them yourself you know right you know right right so it's like that you know you know right you know so it's like that in terms of the sustainability and the management of resources when it comes to sea life and wild game i think that a lot of people perhaps might be unaware that uh many of the people that make a living such as like commercial fishermen for example um have much more of a vested interest in protecting the environment than perhaps even some environmental activists right and i'm thinking to a part in your show where i found this i don't know if i why i was surprised by this but i was like oh shit these guys take it very seriously where there was one point you guys were out catching lobster and you got a lobster full of a bunch of eggs a mama lobster and it was like oh no no we don't keep that and then they put a little notch in her tail to indicate to the next person that traps yeah, you're going to lose your license that if you keep that one. You're going to lose your license. Like, and she's going to help they, they are, The lobster industry kind of in Maine is known for self-regulation. It's quite an effective model as they're starting to include fishermen in the conversation. I'm, um, I'm looking to interview this woman right now who's lost all her scientific funding because she believes that the Atlantic bluefin population is stronger than – there's a there's – a, there's a, a party line right now that bluefin tuna in the Atlantic are in peril. But the fishermen are going like, mm, I don't think so. We're the ones who see them every day. Like, there's quite a lot of these around, right? She's been defunded. She's now working out of her garage because her research is saying, hey, we're we're actually maybe these are they're a lot healthier than we realize. Stocks are okay. Like, like uh, no, the environmental policy right now is we're trying to shut this industry down. So you get this challenge because you've got um, you've got environmentalists on one end. You're like sh- sea shepherd type folks are gonna like you know drive out and stop your boat with their like little jet skis and then you have like regulators who are just trying to do the science on this but the problem is those folks aren't fishermen they're not seeing these animals in the way that the people who fish for them commercially are you need all the voices at the table um that said lots of animals have been massively depleted now here's what's interesting people will be like these animals are depleted because of hunting these animals are depleted because of fishing it's like well there's nuance here let's parse that here's how that works market hunting is now illegal for mammals there's a couple of rare exceptions and a couple of places where there's exceptions market hunting is where you used to harvest the game and then What's sell it to the people who don't hunt actually going to sell the game this happened with the passenger pigeon and we actually caused its extinction most people in america okay. do not know the history well, about passenger pigeons man passenger pigeons were so dense they would fly overhead of your city and it would darken the sky for three days as a river of pigeons flew overhead blotting out the sun for days people would be shooting cannons of shot and broken seashells into the air and just i mean the harvest was this animal was unbelievable we caused its extinction it's a truly truly sad story but it wasn't people who were hunting for their own subsistence it was people who were hunting to sell it to people who don't, aren't getting their own food okay now here's the thing what's causing in most cases what's causing the depletion of fish stocks is not people like me who go out and catch a fish to bring home and eat it's the demand of the people who don't fish who want to eat those fish does that make sense it's the people who are saying that this is wrong but eating that fish it's all the hipsters at the sushi place who have this massive demand for parts of these fish but are not involved in the fishery because fishing market hunting for fish is still a legal thing whereas it's illegal like you can't do that with deer i can't even barter deer so if you came over and you said hey man i harvested these shrimp uh, and i noticed that you got a deer this year do you want to trade that's illegal 
I can give you, I can give you, yeah, of course, think about it. Because that means I have to put a monetary value. Well, this much shrimp is worth this much. Now we're starting to do a financial transaction that's against the law. I can gift you a piece. You can gift me some of what you have, but we can't be doing that on some kind of economic level because that'll lead to poaching. As soon as you start to put a value on it, it leads to poaching. You with me? So what's going on is <clears throat> not everybody can go out and hunt everything. Yeah. Some animals, like for instance in Maine, we have our moose. They're our iconic mammal here. I can't just go out and hunt a moose every year. And when I get my hunting license, I can't get a moose tag. I have to put into a lottery system and a certain number of moose tags, about 2,000 are given out every year so that, that we don't over harvest them. If twice as many people want to hunt next year, they're going to have to give out half as many tags. Does that makes sense? Like you can't, well, they're going to give out the same number of tags, I should say. They can't like uh, sell more of those tags because it will affect the moose population. Some animals are abundant enough that everybody can get involved over the counter. Some animals, people put their, they spend their whole life trying to get a tag and never do. So this is very well regulated, right? So hunting is very well regulated. Fisheries in the ocean, now I'm doing a lot of podcast episodes with people in the fisheries to try to figure this thing out. It's a little more complicated because there's huge demand, not just in the United States, and most of our seafood is exported actually to other countries that have huge seafood intakes. But the problem again is not people fishing for their own food or for the feeding their families or feeding their friends. It's people who are fishing with massive trawlers, draggers, and are pulling up huge amounts of these fish and then having all this bycatch that they kill off or dump back in the sea dead, and then they sell that into markets. That's really the problem. And, you know, ultimately, Ultimately, I think we'll see that go away the way we did see that with, you know, the market hunting for bison. Look what it did, right? I mean, nearly extincted the species. So people will blame that on hunters. And I'm like, man, it's not the hunters. It's you guys who are buying it. You know, it's really interesting how all that works. Oh, can I say one more thing? Like, let me just say one more piece. Do you think Unfortunately, that, uh, where we're at right now is there's extremely little yeah. um, regulation on plants. So I don't have to worry as much when I hunt. Um, I don't have to self-regulate as much because I'm, I'm legally um, regulated. Like there's already decisions are already made. And, um, you know, I have several people on my show. I just interviewed the bear biologist for Maine after at the, the last week of his career, 37 years. He's the one who helped set the policy for how many bears we can harvest. Or I, har I got to interview the migratory bird specialist and upland game bird specialist. He decides how many turkeys we can hunt. Right? That's already decided. Nobody's saying, well, this is how many leeks you can take. This is how many fiddleheads you can take. This is how many whatever that plant is. There's a little bit of regulation around, around wild rice in the Great Lakes region. But otherwise, plants are unregulated, and they're the property of the landowner. So think about this. The way it works in the United States is if an animal, a wild animal is on your property, that is not your animal. It is like that in England. It's not like that here. The animals are owned in trust by the people. You own all of the deer in California as much as every other resident of California. You guys own in trust those animals. Now you can control access. So if the animal's on your property, you can be like, well, nobody's allowed on my property. And as long as that animal's on your property, nobody can really get access to it because it'd be trespassing on your property. But as soon as that animal crosses off your property, it's up to anybody who's got a hunting license in the right season to be able to harvest that animal because you guys share ownership technically legally of the animal. But you are technically legally, the, the, as a landowner, you own the rooted plants on your property. So I can't come on your property and forage legally without your permission, right? So it's, it's just this completely unregulated thing. As a landowner, you can rip up the plants if you want to. It's up to you. Now, it's getting very confusing. We have a lot of sea, a lot of battles here in court right now going on about seaweeds because seaweeds aren't plants. So we don't know who owns the seaweeds. We don't know if they're owned and trust by the people. We don't know if they're the, who owns the intertidal zone? Oh, does, trippy. Does the person who owns up to the shore own the intertidal zone when those seaweeds are – What a, we have Canadian companies down here harvesting huge amounts of our seaweed habitat, taking up bladder rack and using it for fertilizer and selling it. And we don't know. Is that, Are they stealing from the people of Maine? We're not sure yet. There's a lot of legal battles going on. So we need more regulation, unfortunately. I hate to say more regulation, but we do need to have – something in place for plants and for algae uh, but we have a really good system in place for animals so if you want to get
get involved in hunting. The thing is, is your money that you spend on your hunting license is going to be used for conservation. That's what that money goes to. It goes to fund the research being done by the biologists. It goes to fund the wardens who protect that game. Um, interestingly, when you buy hunting equipment or even firearms that are not for hunting and ammunition that's not, if you go buy an AR-15 or a Glock handgun, here's what's interesting. There's an ele- built-in 11% tax on that firearm that goes to the federal government and the federal government allots that money to the states to fund wildlife research and, and habitat. I got to recently go down and, and interview somebody from the Federal Fish and Game and talk about this, the Pittman-Robinson Act, which has been around since the 40s. Think about this. like If we, you know, there's a, a big push against the Second Amendment. If we ban guns, we're going to have to figure out where that 11% is going to come from. Because that's how we fund, right? A lot of people who want to see animals on the landscape oh, do not understand that they are actually fighting against something that's funding it. So that's really interesting. And that's also true of fishing rods and archery equipment. So this is really well established, but we do need more on the plant side and more on the algae side, more on the mushroom side, because that doesn't exist yet. But we do need more on the plant side and more on the algae side, more on the mushroom side, because that doesn't exist yet. Do you think there's more poaching and illegal activity and uh, and greed, oh, yeah. corruption oh, yeah. on the open sea than there is yeah. on the land? Well, it's, because there, it's there's international the, the waters, of right? open space. We now that control out to, catch um, to 200 to miles. So the federal government, the states control out to, at least here, they control out to three miles. And, or maybe it's, it's two to three miles. Don't quote me on that. Somewhere between two and three miles. And then from that line out to 200 miles is our exclusive economic zone. So back in the day, what was happening is a Chinese or a Russian trawler, Japanese trawler could come into our inshore waters and fish it out and then leave and sell that fish on and off into another marketplace or bring it home, right? Now we control our Coast Guard controls out to the 200 mile line. Outside of that is open international waters. And so I wouldn't say it's like poaching is the big problem. And poaching is not a huge problem now in the United States. I mean, we we have a pretty good system in place. For sure, there's people who poach, but um, we have good law enforcement for that. We have good regulation and we have a good culture in the hunting world that we frown upon that. Like we're not, most hunters are not supportive of poaching, right? Most of us are very against that. Um, We participate fairly in the system. What the big problem is, is the big seafood markets. Like I was talking about before, it's, it's, it's sushi, man. It's fish consumption in other countries. And, and what it is is nations going into other nations' waters and fishing it out in ways that they wouldn't want to do at home or that they already did at home and there's not enough fish left and then bringing that back to markets. And so, um, yeah, the seas, because we don't have global governance, we have you know sovereign nation governance, it's pretty awkward what happens in the spaces in between. We don't have a good system for that. It's pretty awkward what happens in the spaces in between. We don't have a good system for that. Wow. What we need that, is like we what we need is like international coalitions that really that agree on how to manage this sense. stuff. We yeah. have that in, like we have that with whales now. There's a right, couple of right. countries. Yeah, there's a couple of countries that are not on board. Norway, Iceland, Japan oh, do? that still have limited very sustainable whale hunts. I'm all for sustainable whale hunts. I, I believe if you can sustainably harvest off a population, not you know compensatory mortality. In other words, what you're killing does not affect the population. The population can continue to grow and fill out. Then I don't have a problem with that. And they're doing that in some places with minke whales and a few other whales. Um, interestingly, I interviewed a guy recently who um, a journalist. I can't wait to release this audio, man. I can't wait for you to hear it. This guy went and lived for a year with a tribe of people in Indonesia who subs- they're hunter gatherers, but unlike most hunter gatherers, most hunter gatherers need huge amounts of space in order to get all their food but these folks don't because they live on in a little coastal village in one of the richest pieces of ocean in the world they live by hunting whales dolphins and giant rays with harpoons they jump they basically have like a dive board off the front of their little boats and they run and dive off and they eat about a 20 sperm whales a year in their village sperm whales like the big whales right and uh they do it very sustainably i mean this can be done sustainably but outside of that and there's some indigenous whale hunts and like i said you have a couple nations all the other nations have gotten together i I mean again i could do three hours on whales there's a lot there most people don't understand that the only reason civil 
globalization is here today in the form that it's in is because of whale oil. Whale oil, before petroleum, it was whale oil. Whale oil lubricated all machines of the Industrial Revolution and lit all the city streets around the world. It was whale oil. You know, people were going, I mean, and it all came right out of Massachusetts primarily is where this happened from. But but this, what went on in the whaling era is the number of whales harvested is shocking and was truly unsustainable. Whales are finally recovering, but most nations have gotten together and, and regulated that. And we need that with, with more of the fisheries. But most nations have gotten together and regulated that. We need that with more of the fisheries. Right. That, that absolutely makes sense. I think um, I do have that thought when I, I'm not a huge sushi eater, but other people are, and I go along at times, but yeah. I think about that. Yeah. Like, man, think of every city in the United States, man, how many w- fucking eel, sushi eel restaurants is a crazy, are? The, what's know, going on with eel, again, I just go fish. on and on about eels, man. It's like all those eels are coming as out of Maine, right where I live. They're harvesting the, ba- the baby eels are born out near the Caribbean as little larva. They float up to the coast here in what they're called glass eels and they start to migrate up into the river system and out into the brooks and everything. When people are catching them, selling them off to the Chinese market, they raise them in captivity in China and then that's what's that unagi that you eat in sushi places and we are stripping by taking them out of Maine, they eventually move down the coast and fill in all along the Atlantic seaboard. Well, now that's not happening and eels are becoming very threatened but there's not really good regulation because the sushi market man it's got a demand so a lot of people this is what we were talking about before if people saw what they were participating in they wouldn't a lot of people they wouldn't but they don't see it and all of us get hungry and we got to eat and it's hard because there's a lot of choices are really tough to make and i think seafood's the most confusing so i will say this little promise here one of the things i'm doing on the podcast is i want to figure this out because i'm confused about what seafood's okay to eat and what isn't i'm confused about that so i'm interviewing a lot of people about it trying to get to the bottom because i think people are just i'm confused they don't know what to do and when you don't know what to do you tend to just do whatever because i think people are just know what to do and when you don't know what to do you oh, well, one more thing one more thing one more thing yeah, one more thing. I, I agree if you live near the um, coast man that if you live near the coast like i do i go yeah. out uh like i have yeah, a boat no, 20 foot london alaskan it's yeah. aluminum yeah. boat 115 yeah. horse motor small boat right i can do inshore stuff i can't go offshore you know i'm not taking that boat 30 miles offshore and the cost of maintaining a boat for that is very very high that's an expensive thing to do uh but i take a trip every year sometimes twice three times out of a gunk with maine it's what's called a head boat so i pay like 200 bucks for the day about 125 and then there's some associated fees because they cut my fish and i gotta pay for parking and all that it costs me maybe 125 130 bucks i go offshore for the day we go out 30 miles and we fish on the bottom three four hundred feet down for we used to fish cod now that fishery's closed for regulation reasons but we fish pollock and haddock and i bring home enough fish from one of those trips to eat fish once a week twice a week three times a week for the rest of the year so i spend a couple hundred bucks i go out and i bring home they cut all that fish right on the boat i come home with fillets i vacuum seal them when i'm so i know that not everyone can do this right like we were talking about before but if you live on the coast you can just take like a day trip you don't need a you don't need equipment they have all the equipment you don't need to know what to do they show you what to do you don't need to know how to fillet fish they fillet the fish for you you got to pay a tip i pay 20 bucks or something to the guy come home with that fish all you got to do is put it in your freezer right and then you're you don't have to think about it anymore it's like you got your fish for the year you know so there's opportunities like that for people just like yourself who are like oh i don't really know how to do any of this but it's kind of neat you know we go out for the day i see whales man i see dolphins i see giant sunfish and basking sharks and watch the birds and i mean it's just an incredible experience and i get enough fish for the year so uh there's a lot of cool opportunities like that and then what's nice about that is you're no longer having to participate in the fish market thing you're kind of off the hook so off the hook huh see what i did you so you you could do that probably right off where you live man right out of la i bet there's all kinds of headboats you could take i'm sure there's got to be fishing opportunities that's that's wild dude wow so much great information here i want to ask you uh, as we start to wrap this up and it's it's funny because you're one of the few guys who puts out content and and owns a company that doesn't really do much promoting of your company <laughs> like in your podcast you'd be like yeah this show is brought to you by sir thrival next you know and it's just kind of like an afterthought but 
Um, I'm, I'm very discerning about the brands that I promote and represent and just that I take personally. And I'm pretty good at yeah, figuring years. out who's doing things right. And you guys have for, as you said, what, 12 years or something now? Just yeah. made, it made a, a really solid product line. And you could have you know, made 400 products and diluted the whole supply chain and made a bunch of bullshit, frankly. But you've kind of just stuck to what you do and you do well. And just for your benefit and the benefit of the listeners, give people like a yeah. little spiel on like some of the cool things that you guys make at Sir Thrival. Um, that the ones that I've yeah. used the most yeah. over the years, I just had some this morning, actually. I shit you not, is the pine pollen extract. Yeah. I always recommend that, especially to men, especially men that are aging. Um, and maybe you can explain why it's so effective at <laughs> sometimes waking yeah. up with a pup tent for a yeah. bed. And also uh, the <laughs> the, col- the colostrum. Yeah. Only only Boy Scouts will know what a yeah. pup tent is. But um, And the colostrum. Like those two are things I'm kind of just always ordering from Sir Thrival. Yeah. But you guys have, you know, these medicinal mushroom blends and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know, so I've just always been interested in like, what are the things that are that missing that make people stronger. You know, it's like we could break it all down, like your immune system, your endocrine system, you know, like all these kind of things. But like, you know, it's like we could break it even if we don't want to like break it all down like that. It's just like what stuff makes you stronger from the environment. Um, there are a lot of wild products in my line, and then there's some that come from agriculture too. Um, the colostrum is an example. Like I use that just about every day. Like I had that twice today because I use it in my. Like, I always tell people it's like your new favorite smoothie ingredient. Like that's a food. That's the first milk that comes out of every mammal the first milking is colostrum when you consume that stuff it is like a gut lining regenerator and it is probably the very best antiviral food you could consume like it gives you it imparts immunity to you against viruses it's pretty powerful stuff it's three times more effective against uh flu than vaccines so this is a food that i promote really heavily to people who one like to blend drinks two or working on their immune system or trying to get recovery athletes who are recovering it's really good for that. It's just an incredible food. We do the pine pollen extracts because pine pollen has testosterone. This is what an, a neat thing was like back in the day, I created that product thinking, okay, at some point in my life, I'm going to need to be on a testosterone supplement. I was in my, you know, I was still pretty young when I developed that product. Now I'm getting to that place where I, I'm going to need it more, you know? Um, but I was also seeing so many men going on bioidentical testosterone. Now we're in this place where like gender is not the thing anymore. Like all kinds of people want testosterone. <laughs> That's been really interesting to me because I did not develop it thinking there, there were going to be, you know, people across the sort of spectrum are going to want to use it. But we're at this point now where a lot of people want to put testosterone into their bodies. And so if you're somebody whose testosterone levels have come down or you're somebody who's trying to bring your testosterone levels up, you'd be amazed at what an alcohol extract of pine pollen can do. Um, we do a D3K2 supplement right now that's selling like crazy because it's like winter time coming. Um, our elk antler products are outrageous, man. I mean, that's just like this steroidal compound that come from elk. You know, elk are the largest species of or probably the second largest species of deer. Um, they're not bigger than moose, but they're a large species of deer on our landscape, especially out west here. And their antlers, when they're in their growth phase, grow three inches a day. And that's a very steroidal compounds in there. So we do all these extracts that I I really think about endocrine, immune, um, recovery, regeneration. And man, they're good products. Like the products that I've been using for 12 years, I really believe in them. Um, and we're about to launch a whole, we're working on a CBD line that is outrageous because I've watched this cbd thing for a while you know and been like well you know it's like there's a lot of stuff out there but we got our hands with some really really cool products so those are going to be coming out probably by well they'll be out in the next couple weeks i'm pretty excited we've been working on it for like about a year uh, we said we got some pretty awesome stuff so anyway all stuff that focuses on making people less chihuahua more wolf pretty awesome stuff so Anyway, all stuff that focuses on making people less chihuahua, more wolf. <laughs> nice. That's a great way to summarize it. And I'm glad I got to touch on that because, like I said, we we never talk about those things. And I think that there's very few companies out there that... Yeah, we've got some real heavy hardcore believers, man. It's like, does, so that's the thing is when you have a really good product, you know, like I don't have to push and promote that hard because people use the products and they come back and they're like, wow, this is really working for me. And a lot of our customers have been with us 12 years. But I do encourage people to just check out the website and like see what we have as offerings because I think you'd be really interested in some of the stuff we have there. Just check out the website and like see what we have as offerings because I think you'd be really interested in some of the stuff. Best, wait, best chaga and oh, yeah. best chaga, best reishi, best medicinal so mushroom products that exist. 
with this. I mean, there's a lot of them out there, but the way they're made is not usually right. And when you do them right, it's expensive, but we do them right. There's a lot of them out there, but the way they're made is not usually right. And when you do them right, it's expensive, but we do them right. Epic. Thank you for that. So we got five minutes left. Uh, tell us, because by the time I, I think people can pre-order the TV show oh, now, cool. this, you know, we're November 20th now. I think this is slated for the beginning of December to come out. So it'll be in, oh, cool. in a couple weeks here. So in terms of the timeline, normally when I record a show, it might not come out for three, four or five months sometimes. And so when someone's announcing a new project, it might have already been out or something. But I think we're kind of in, in a nice time right now. So give us the timeline on... We know the podcast is out every Tuesday, which is when my show comes oh, out. Cool. So <laughs> I didn't mean to bite. I'm sharing Tuesdays as an exciting day. Um, when oh, cool. when can <laughs> yeah? When can <laughs> you bite? No, no. I th you had a show out on Tuesdays first, just to be fair. Hey. Um, I just picked that <laughs> day because I was like Mondays, everyone's That's too busy. It. Fridays, everyone wants to fuck off for the weekend. Like Tuesdays, That's you it. know, not quite midweek. Um, you got bored at work on Monday, and so Tuesday you want a little something, uh, but. Tell us, like, you know, when people can watch the show yeah. and then also about the online program that you've got coming up, which I think sounds super cool for someone like me that is just wants to get involved in this way of life. Yeah, so we're running it's these two things concurrently. And, and, and like, like I said before, I mean, we just don't have that network backing. We don't have, like, a big Netflix launch yet. We're not, like, at, and, and like that's not where the show is at. So, so it was like, how do we put the show out? So here's what we're doing. Starting January 6th, we're, develop, we're delivering one episode a week for eight weeks because there's eight episodes in season one. So um, January 6th, whether you're in the program or whether you just want to see the show, each week, Mondays, you'll get a new episode so you get all the episodes that way. What we're doing is if you want to see the show on its own, so those shows are 30 minutes long too. They're not 22 minutes. Almost every TV show, if, it, if a show is a half an hour, it's actually 22 minutes of content because of the commercial breaks. We've done full 30-minute episodes, eight of them, so it's quite a bit of content. Um, you'd be surprised at how much longer a 30-minute show feels than a 22-minute Netflix show. You know, you really can feel it. But So um, right now, pre-sales are open. It's 49 bucks. You pay 49 bucks, you'll get the whole season one episode at a time starting January 6th. So big thanks to all the people who've gone over to support us, um, knowing that they're not going to see the shows till January. It means a lot to us, so thank you. Um, we're also running a program. Uh, we're calling it the Wild Fed Season 1 Experience. So what that is, is each week you'll get an episode of the show, but you'll also be getting a director's cut. What I want to do is take like an hour and a half to break the episode down because there's so much going on that I can't fit into the 30 minutes. Like how does it work legally what we're doing? How do you get involved in it? What is the equipment I'm using? How did I get this connection? How do you get your foot in the door? How do you access it? Why are we doing it this way? All that kind of stuff. Also, all the crazy intrigue and stuff that happens in the shows that I don't. There's been some interesting dramas that have happened, you know, with other that, that doesn't make it into the show. So we'll be breaking all that down. Then there's going to be a structured Q&A with every episode. So each Q&A will be sort of designed to develop out your understanding of how to get involved in some of this lifestyle. Like I said, even if you just want to do one thing a year, or you're like, I want to get, I want to go full bore so we'll be doing that and then of course there's like a private member group so that'll run nine weeks um, where I'll be one of the moderators in there so people have access to me you know exclusive access for that nine weeks so they'll get the shows they'll get the director's cuts they'll get the Q&A's and we'll be in there having these discussions as a community so um, whether you get the show on its own or you're part of that we'll be delivering that stuff once a week starting January 6th I just want to let everybody get through the new year and have some time to sell the show in, in you know in advance but um, I'm really excited for people to see it. It's like, it was so cool for me today. You started writing me being like, oh man, these episodes are really cool. And I just haven't shown it to many people. We've kept it kind of a big secret, you know, uh, as I've developed it. So I just haven't shown it to many people. We've kept it kind of a big secret, you know? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, you mentioned something a few months ago that you were, you know, going in this direction. But honestly, I was kind of thinking, like, oh, <laughs> doing YouTube maybe, videos. <laughs> maybe he just kind of like is living his life, and you know, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, he got married, and just you know, I was like, oh, okay, I guess. Yeah, it's not like I don't it's know not me in a polo shirt that, and then when that I, says I, Wild I Fed. When I saw it, I was like, final oh, banner shit, behind dude, me that says Wild is, Fed doing eight minute YouTube videos. It's a show. It's if you're used to if you watch TV shows, it's a TV show just like any other, except it's a little bit longer than the average half hour show. TV shows, it's a TV show, just like any other, except it's a little bit longer than the average half-hour show. Cool, man. Well, I'm I'm really stoked to help you get that out there and turn people on to <laughs> it because I think it's just, yeah, thank you. I don't know, it's just good for humankind in general to yeah. get closer to nature, man. That's it. I mean, to just boil it down like that. And um, and also, uh, the part that I, I think is intriguing, even though I'm not a big foodie, as I said, is just 
is also incorporating the culinary aspect of it too because i realized <laughs> i'm kind of an anomaly most human beings really enjoy eating tasty food and even as someone and even as someone who's not motivated by food per se um just watching like the culinary creations that <laughs> come at the end of the episode like i'm like ah god i want to taste that because these are foods that you know most modern humans i, I always say it's the, be, it's the best food had, like, money can't corn buy. flour or any of this stuff that you're working with and i'm just like i always say it's the, it's the best food money can't buy Right. That's a good tagline. And so I'm going, I can't go to Air One and buy that. You know, it's like I literally would have to know someone like you or learn from someone like you how to go out and procure those from my environment. And then also to process them and yeah. understand how to use the tools with which you do that processing, which is a whole other thing. Well, you know, thing. and so I it's think just, it's like, it's super I, let me just cool say this too. It's it like somebody has to carry um, the wild food torch here. in this generation. It's like, I, you know what I mean? Every yeah. generation, somebody has somebody to do has it to or it goes extinct. Our, our ancestral right. food gathering right. technique goes extinct. It, so it goes extinct. I don't, I know that I, if a thousand people listen to this, there's like one or two people who's like, Ooh, that's me. I want to be part of that. If you're that person, like get on board with us. We say, join the subsistence. Like, please get involved sign up for news or get our social media whatever it is and get involved because help us carry this torch forward because this is so important it's so important that that some people are involved in it and if if you just heard this and you're like well that's all really interesting it's like hey man keep doing your thing because it's like i'm not saying that everybody needs to do this i just want to grab a hold of the people who are interested and kind of give them a platform a give them a, a, a roadmap to get involved and kind of give them a platform and give them a, a, a roadmap to get involved rad in closing give i write us the a links lot on to instagram at daniel vitalis rad. so uh that's where right. you can connect with me like if you want to connect with me instagram don't try to do it through vitalis. facebook so, uh, i'm not going to be there um get me on instagram at daniel vitalis the wild fed is uh at wild dot um, uh fed because you know how it is trying to get your stuff sometimes um the website is wild-fed.com again wild-fed.com if you go over there obviously all our social media but also join the subsistence that's our newsletter every two weeks we put out really good content it is not like a jam and sales all the time that it's like we're going to put content in there so um if you're into this stuff that'll be a place to get some exclusive stuff that i don't put out anywhere else um but yeah please keep hanging on my uh, instagram that's where i really love to connect Keep oh, wait, wait, wait. And, and the Wild Fed podcast. Get, get the Wild Fed podcast. Awesome, man. Thanks Obviously. for coming on the show. This has been a fantastic one. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. The Wild Fed oh, podcast, so. which is super easy to find uh, where you find the rest of these great podcasts. Daniel, dude, really great to catch up with you. It's been a while. Uh, I'm so pleased for your success and the Thank work you, you're man. doing. I think you've really like found your stride and your niche here, and it's just so cool to see this Thank unfold. You. And I'm um, so happy to share with people. So until we meet again, with maybe, you, dude. maybe when with we meet you. again, you'll be coming out here to do some episodes on the SoCal landscape. With and you, yeah, well, teach I'll, me I'll and these we'll city slickers how to go out and live off the land. Thanks so much, Luke. Uh, I'll, I'll go out with you. All right, brother. I'll see you soon.